I have several stories of Mexico. It's a place of many myths and legends. This one is one that a friend of mine recounted to me about his uncle and his uncle's friend stuck in a horrifying circumstance. So my buddy's uncle and his friend were headed home on a highway one night years ago in the state of Oaxaca. You see, they rode in one of those old flatbed trucks that are used to put whatever vegetables or fruits might have been picked that day. They were farmers, most were, as Oaxaca was very rural at the time and had only just had a highway installed of actual concrete. As they were returning home, the uncle noticed something in the rearview mirror and made out what seemed to be a horse about 150 feet away. He couldn't really make out its features and didn't think anything of it till he drifted off to sleep in the passenger seat. As he slept, the uncle had a small nightmare of a horse with large black eyes running up to his passenger side. The dream startled him awake. He gathered his bearings when he looked over to his buddy that was driving. His buddy had a terrified look on his face and was driving about 50 miles an hour which, at the time, was pretty fast for a truck that size. He said, why are you driving so fast? And the friend responded by saying that they were being followed. He said that for the past couple of miles, that horse in the rear view was slowly inching its way closer and closer to the vehicle. That's when the panic began to settle in, and they both felt immense fear wash over them. They sped up to about 65 to try and get away, but the clanking of the hooves of this horse slowly kept getting louder and louder behind them. The one driving said not to turn around and look anymore, to just look ahead and not look at the horse, because it seemed to gain on them whenever they glanced back at it. The uncle closed his eyes in fear, only listening, and when the hooves inched closer and closer, he glanced to the side of the window and saw the large black eyes of the horse looking directly at his friend from the passenger side as it had now caught up. It was just like his dream. The uncle screamed for his friend not to look and to just look straight because the horse had a fixated gaze on him. They sped up all they could and still the horse kept a swift pace still staring at the driver. When he finally glanced, he began to cry, overwhelmed with emotion and panic, when the horse suddenly began to slow down. As it did, the uncle saw it in the rearview mirror once more, except this time it had no legs. It was just standing in the road, floating, staring at them with its huge black eyes. They told the grandfather of the man driving when they arrived home what they had witnessed and he told them that the road that was built there had gone straight through sacred Nahuatl territory, and they had been lucky to drive past the area at this time of night and survive, because everyone had felt that the ground there was salado, or salted, meaning washed with bad energy. This is a 100% true story that I will keep with me until the day I die. A number of years ago, when I was still living at home with my dad and stepmom, we had a large, beautiful, purebred German Shepherd. I had had a rough childhood, and this dog was my best friend. He was the smartest and most loyal dog I had, and still have, ever met. He passed away a few years after this incident, and I still think of him, and miss him often. Anyway. Our house had a long hallway off the living room. Down the hallway was a bedroom on the left, followed by a bathroom and my bedroom that was at the very end. I had lived there since I was two and I was used to being alone. I usually preferred it, honestly. So I was very comfortable in my surroundings. This particular evening, my dad and stepmom had gone out and I was sitting on my bed watching TV with my dog laying next to me. 
The front and back door were closed and locked, as well as the windows as I live in the north and at night, especially in the fall, winter, and spring months, it gets quite cold. My bedroom door was closed and latched. My TV and light were on and one lamp in the living room was on, but no other electronics were on in the house. My dog and I were just sitting there on my bed. Movement caught my eye. My dog lifted his head to look at my door just as I turned my head. The two of us watched the door handle turning, as if someone were on the other side, opening the door. As the handle turned and the door opened, my dog sat up to attention, looking very tense. The door very slowly creaked open all of the way. I was quite stunned as I knew that I was home alone, and although I just saw the door handle turn and the door open, I could see nothing there that could have opened my door. Suddenly, my dog jumped up and off my bed. He took off running down the hallway faster than I could even react. As I got up to go investigate, I could hear the rumble of his growl coming from the living room. It got louder and louder as I got farther down the hallway. When I looked into the living room, he was standing underneath the ceiling fan, directly in the middle of the room, looking straight up. Remember, the fan wasn't on. The only things on in the entire house were a single lamp in the living room and my bedroom light and television. The black hair along his entire back was raised. He stood frozen, snout pointed up, growling fiercely. I stared at him for a second as I had never seen him behave like this. He was so fixated on whatever it was that I didn't think he realized I'd followed him down the hall. Quietly, I called out to him. I called his name and asked him what was wrong. As soon as the words left my mouth, he spun around and stepped to me. He began making a soft whimpering noise, mushing his head against me, pushing me back down the hallway. As I moved backward, he pushed harder. I turned away from the living room, and we were both running back down the hall by the time we got to my bedroom door. I turned my body to face the door as we crossed into my bedroom, and my door slammed shut and locked behind us on its own. I watched from three feet away as the lock turned. I have heard and read that when a door is slammed hard enough, the mechanism inside may get jostled enough to lock itself. But what had slammed the door shut in the first place? My dog stood by the door, not making a sound. He stared at the door handle, not moving a muscle. I called my dad, trying not to sound panicked as I knew they wouldn't believe my story and tried to casually ask when he would be home. He told me that they were on their way and about 20 minutes out. My dog stood there, not moving, keeping his body between me and the door until my parents came home that night. I don't know what it is that had the power to unlatch and open my door, slam it shut, and lock it. I don't know what it was that my dog saw that night, but I could feel that while he was pushing me away from the living room, he was trying to protect me. He knew it wasn't safe. He was pushing me away from whatever he saw or felt. He stood guard for me until my parents came home. He was my best friend and my protector. Rest in peace, buddy. Thank you for keeping me safe. I grew up in a house on a rural back road and looking back on it now in my adult life, I feel like there was a lot of dark energy in the house. There were a few events that happened to me and others while living in that house that I will never forget. This is one of the experiences that happened to my brother and I. For backstory, I lived in a very small rural city with a thousand people on an island, in an area rich with dense forests vast hay fields, and roads that go on and on to seemingly nowhere. Truthfully, I was a very strong-minded kid who, oddly enough, would adventure into the woods all day alone. Or we would play hide-and-seek outside at nighttime around our property. Some nights, I would even go outside and just lay in my yard and watch the stars. None of that bothered me, but I was scared of my house. 
My little brother, who shared this one particular experience with me, slept with his bedroom light on his entire childhood. I spent a lot of time sneaking into my parents' room during the night to feel safer. I never liked going into the basement by myself. I avoided the wood room in our basement as much as I could, and I also didn't like being home alone. This whole event happened over two minutes on a summer day. I was 15, and my brother was 11. My parents were at work, which was normal. And I remember my brother and I laying on our couch. We were home alone, watching TV in the living room, and sitting about six feet away from the landing of a flight of stairs, which goes to the second floor. In my house, once at the top of the L-shaped stairs, there's a door directly ahead of you, a door to the right, and an empty hallway to the left with four other doors and other rooms. There's nothing in the hallway, just light bulbs and switches. While watching TV, I heard a noise upstairs, a muffled thud. Just the wind. That's what you instinctively tell yourself, right? We continued to watch TV, and at this point, my brother hadn't even acknowledged or noticed the first noise. But I had, because it was so strange. Then, the same sounding noise came again. It wasn't one single sound, but a couple of sounds tied together that made it seem more intentional. The noise wasn't anything I could pinpoint, but it did sound like a brief second of furniture moving very slightly. That was enough to scare me, and my brother could tell at this point that I was very focused on the stairs and not the television. These noises were not extremely loud, but definitely not something created by wind. I was nervous, and I muted the television for a moment, so the house was basically silent. After one more thud from upstairs, I was petrified, and I started to sit up a bit. My brother was also beginning to become more alert and nervous. I remember him saying something to reassure me, and we both sat up. He began to say something else as I was trying to listen acutely and figure out what the hell was going on upstairs. I snapped, listen. At that second, a much, much louder and closer series of sharp crashing sounds occurred. This time it was so loud and sudden that when it happened instinctively we both jumped up and started to run out of the living room through the kitchen as quickly as we could. We tried to run outside and get out of the house. I tried to open the door and it wouldn't budge, almost like it was locked. But it wasn't locked, because the knob still moved, it just wouldn't push open. I don't think that the door has ever acted like that before, or since. I started to run to the sunroom, where the French doors led outside, and my brother followed. While we both ran full tilt to the other doors, on the way, I looked into the living room, and at the base of the stairs, I saw an out-of-place faux glass drinking cup. I realized that it was the source of the last sharper crashing sound, because it had hit the walls in the staircase before tumbling down the last stairs and landing in the living room. Trying to figure out how it had gotten from a bedroom or bathroom to the bottom of the stairs still scares me to this day. I have no explanation of what created the energy to cause the noises, and for the glass to travel the distance it did. There was another strange moment in that event because when we got to the other doors, I'll never forget in the half second it took me to unlock that door, my eyes were locked on a housefly that was alive and buzzing inside the glass. It got smeared against the window pane of the door as if something had swatted it, right in front of me. But nothing was there, and even if somebody had been, nobody could have reached it because it was between the glass. It was so sinister and shocking to see the once living fly get smushed before my very eyes as if an invisible force had put pressure on it. When I opened the door, we continued to run barefoot the fifty or so feet as fast as we could to our neighbor's house, who's also my Aunt Michelle. We instinctively ran as quickly as we could, and we felt much safer there. We didn't bother to explain it in detail, until my aunt asked what happened, and we just said something had scared us. I remember her laughing at us because she thought that we were overreacting. It was really hard to sleep in that house that night, 
And I bet my life my brother slept with the light on. And I did too. Maybe five years ago, we were talking about scary things amongst friends. And I asked him, Do you remember the day we were so scared that we ran over to Michelle's house? He replied laughing with, Nope, we were scared a lot back in the day. I left it at that. I'm staying at his condo right now, and he's sleeping beside me peacefully, with the lights out. I'm tempted to ask him again what he remembers from that day, or any of the things that he remembers happening in our home, but I don't want to bring it up. I want to keep those memories out of his head, and I think he does too, and I definitely don't want new memories in mine. A lot of times I wish I didn't remember some of the things, because I don't like revisiting those memories myself. But that house, and that day in particular, was terrifying. I was still in school. My brother and sister were both in elementary school, and I'm certain that it was my senior year. We lived with my grandmother in her three-bedroom home. Our dad worked night shifts, so it would just be the four of us at night. Anyway, at this point, my little brother and sister would be put in bed between 8 and 8.30. I had always shared a room with my little sister, but that week she had started sleeping in the front bedroom, which was right by the living room, leaving me in the back bedroom alone, on the end of the house. My dad's room was across from mine, and between our room is a small cupboard that my grandmother used to store canned goods from the garden. It had access to the attic space. Across from my sister's room was the bathroom, and at the other end of the house was the living room and the kitchen. I've always slept with my room dark, but my door open. We would leave the bathroom light on since it kept the hallway pretty lit up just in case somebody woke up needing to use the bathroom during the night. It was around 9.30 on a school night, and both my sister and brother were already in bed asleep. Our grandmother was in the bathroom folding clothes with the door shut, but the kitchen light was still on, so I was still able to see light coming through my doorway. It wasn't so bright that I couldn't sleep, though. I had just gotten off the phone with my boyfriend at the time and decided that I was going to go ahead and go to bed, even though it was still super early for me, as I didn't usually go to bed until between 10.30 and 11. I had just set my alarm for 5.30 and I laid my phone down. I hadn't even laid back in the bed yet when I heard the pitter-patter of feet coming down the hall. I looked over to see my brother standing at my door in the dim light. Now it was so dark that all I could see was his outline. I couldn't tell anything about his features whatsoever. I said, go get your butt back in bed. I know, wonderful sister, huh? But instead of going back to bed, he gets on his hands and knees and shuffles to the end of my bed where I can't see anything. I wait a few seconds, like maybe 10 or so, for him to pop up and say boo or something, but he didn't. So I grab my phone to look, and as I'm grabbing it, I say, Brother, you've got to get up in a little while for school, come on. But when I shine the light down there, I didn't see him. My closet was at the foot of my bed too, but there was no room for him to get in there, and I would have heard him if he had tried. I also would have heard him and seen him had he ran back to the living room, but there was nothing after the shuffling on all fours. He also couldn't have gone under my bed as the box springs were setting flat on the floor. I almost couldn't believe what I had just seen. I could have sworn that it was my brother. Freaked out, I leapt out of bed and ran into the hall to go ask my grandmother where my brother went. She was confused and said that he'd been sound asleep since eight. I go to the living room where the TV was flooding enough light to see, and sure enough, he was asleep on the love seat, snoring. That happened in 2013 or 2014. Fast forward to 2017, I'm pregnant and living back in that same house while Cody and I are waiting for our place to be ready. My grandmother is now staying with my aunt and so are my brother and sister, so my dad is living there alone. To help my aunt out, I start keeping my brother and he keeps me company since our dad is still working night shift for the time being. 
I was afraid to be alone in this house at night, considering that it had been broken into twice already. And even though my 11-year-old brother wouldn't be able to protect me, somehow I still felt safer with him there. I had worked third shift for a while, so sleeping at night was still a little bit foreign to me, so I would be up late after my brother had gone to sleep. We kept the tradition of leaving the bathroom light on at night, with everything else off, but at this time, I wasn't sleeping in the back room. Instead, I was sleeping in the front bedroom where my sister had been. I should also tell you that this room never had a door. Like, even when the house was built, it just never had a door. So we used a sheet as a curtain for it. I would pull the sheet back and leave it open some nights. And on one night, I was laying there and I look up and I see that same dark shadow. This time though, I hadn't heard any footsteps or shuffling. I closed my eyes for a minute and opened them, hoping that he would be gone. But instead, he was standing right next to my bed, staring down at me. I put the covers over my head and hid the rest of the night, and I didn't sleep a wink. After that, I started sleeping with my TV on. That August, one of my grandmother's friends moved in to help me out. Mind you, she didn't, but that's not crucial to the story. I had started to get very pregnant around that time, and my grandmother was afraid of me being alone going into labor. I had said something like, I think I'm going crazy, because it had gotten to where I was seeing and hearing things non-stop. She assured me that I wasn't. She paused, looked at me, and said, You're seeing a little boy, aren't you? Now let me tell you, I've never told this woman anything about what happened, so for her to come out and say that scared me. She told me how some nights she would wake up and look over by my doorway and see him standing there. That at first she thought it was my brother, but she'd look over and he would be asleep on the love seat. When I was 14, I had visions from my future. Most of those visions were little things, like a song in the car, me being in class, playing with a pet, what somebody would be wearing, things like that. I had these visions until I was 16. And that's when the worst vision I had took place. I had pictures of myself being killed at my own house by a man wearing a Jason mask. When I had this vision, it started with me being all alone in my house, brushing my hair after taking a shower. I was in pajamas, which were mint with purple dots. And then I saw the man in my backyard's rooftop and ran downstairs to try to get answers on why he'd been following me. When I had this vision, I didn't quite understand that yet. I noticed my dog was in my backyard, and I didn't want him to get killed or something, so I opened the door for him to get inside. The man got there first, and quickly reached to the floor and grabbed a machete that my family had near where he landed. I ran to the bathroom on the second floor, but he caught me and stabbed me to death. Like I said, I had this vision when I was 16, so ever since that moment, I started to hide the machete under the stairs instead, letting my dog inside the house and keeping him with me every moment. I wore the pajamas in my vision as little as possible. I locked the three doors of my home, front, back, and balcony, whenever I was alone. And if I was incapable of doing it at that moment, I would ask for my parents to lock them before leaving me at home. Remember when I said I asked the man why he'd been following me? Well, apparently, ever since I was around 15, I would see somebody follow me home from school. Other times, I would see them hiding in the dark, or watching my home across the street. I told my parents about it, and they contacted the police. Some neighbors backed us up because they had seen him too. About three months after my dog died, I stopped doing all of these precautionary things. I was still so scared that it took me that long to realize that now that my dog was dead, my death probably wasn't going to happen, since my dog was an integral part of the vision. About four days after I stopped hiding all these things around, the news announced that they had found a killer in our city who was breaking in and using a Jason mask. To this day, I don't understand why I had those visions, 
but I know that heeding them saved my life. It was a late night in summer, and there were some families gathered for a birthday party at my friend's farmhouse. Most of the people had already left, but we stayed because our families were good friends. They had set up a fire outside, and everybody was gathered around it. There were four of us kids in the group, and we were all around nine to ten or so. Behind the fire gathering, there was a medium-sized hill, which the four of us decided to run to the top of and then roll down. We did this a couple of times and thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. From the top of the hill, you could see the farmhouse facing straight forward, and off to the side of the hill was a barn. There was a light somewhere near us that allowed our shadows to show up on the side of the barn. So we would continue going up the hill, see our shadows, and sometimes we would try to make little shadow puppets and things like that. One of these times that we climbed the hill, we decided to try and make letters with our body shadows on the barn wall. We had all lined up four in a row, and that's when we noticed that there was a fifth shadow on the barn. A little confused, we looked around at each other, looking to see if there was a fifth person up there with us, but there wasn't. I remember looking back at the barn, and the fifth shadow, which hadn't moved at all, immediately took off in a running motion and completely disappeared from view. This startled all of us, and we ran back down the hill to our parents and the fire. I'm not really sure what it was that we saw, but it definitely freaked us out, and it's something we still bring up every now and again, and we're all still a little spooked by it. This is a little bit hard to explain, but I'll give it my best shot. With every near-death experience I've had, and I've had a lot, I always see the exact same place with the exact same person next to me. Altogether, I've had maybe six experiences like this since I was a child, the first being when I was about five. The first time, I remember standing in the middle of what looked to be a brightly lit carnival of sorts, right smack in the middle of a large field of tall grass that went on further than what I could see. The sky is this inky dark blue hue that wasn't scary at all, considering I hated the darkness back as a kid. I remember walking next to somebody, someone who felt like a total stranger but not uncomfortable to be around. For the life of me, I couldn't seem to turn my head to look at their face. Instead, I stared at a large blue bouncy house slide that many children were going down, having the time of their lives. Where it ended, I couldn't see. All I know is that I wanted to go. I had to go down it. An unexplained impulse told me to climb up and throw myself down it, take me wherever it went. But I also felt like I was compelled not to. With that, I woke up sometime later in the ER, getting treated for a head wound I sustained from falling down a flight of concrete stairs. The next few times, whether from drowning to being stabbed, every single time I went back to that same place. I felt that I existed in this place however I currently was, age, hairstyle, you name it. I've asked every family member I could think of if they remember such a place that they might have taken me but all of them said no. The latest was less than a year ago, when one night I unknowingly went to sleep with a very bad concussion that I might not have woken up from. I sustained it during my latest and final football game played in my freshman year of high school. I woke up around 3 a.m., and before I could even rise to my feet, I felt a terrible pain lash out in my head, and I passed out. This time, when I went back to this place, I finally saw the face of the stranger that I've been with throughout the years. More than that, I felt pretty happy. Unexplainable joy that caused me to do some sort of ballroom dance with them. But then I had to leave. I don't remember if it was because of something they said or something in the outside world. But once again, I woke up, separated from whoever or whatever that was. 
and I felt instantly sad for what felt like a ridiculous reason. Along with that, I lost all memory of what that person looked like, which made me feel even worse. What's weird is that I don't dance though, ever. I never have, and it would take some serious bribery to make me do so, but in this dream I was just freely dancing like it was something I did all the time. I have to say, it was probably one of the highlights of my life, oddly enough. I don't have any clue as to what's going on, but I think that maybe I've encountered my personification of death. Like, maybe we each have something or someone that comes to visit us when we're about to die. Maybe it's the same person, or maybe it's individual to each. All I know is that I have this gut feeling that this time wasn't my last time visiting them, or that place. It was late at night, 15 years ago. My friends and I were walking down Main Street, past the neighborhood cemetery, Evergreen. None of our parents had a clue. They thought that we were safe at our friend's house. Her parents were away, so it was a prime sleepover location, and a great opportunity to adventure after dark, like the rebels that we clearly were. As we were walking and talking, my friend Marissa stops and yells, Do you guys see that? We had no idea what she was talking about. It was a light, she said, and it flew through the cemetery. Tell me you guys saw that. After some debate, my best friend of the group, Casey, looked at me, cocked her head, and wagged her eyebrows. She and I were known to be the more daring types in our grade, which was hilarious because we were only 11. We weren't bullies or anything, although Casey's rough and tough attitude often left people intimidated. It's just that we were never ones to turn down a challenge. She and I dashed across the street and up the hill. We strolled deeper into the cemetery, remaining on the narrow, designated footpath riddled with weeds protruding through stone crevices. We weaved through rows, glancing at graves, unable to read their occupants' names. We neared the edge of the graveyard and end to our adventure, having seen nothing but a whole bunch of darkness. Casey stopped took one last survey of her surroundings and said, there's nothing here, let's just go. She started back the way we came. I sighed, half disappointed. I wouldn't say that I believe in ghosts, but I'm pretty open-minded. If somebody gave me hard proof, I'd still be a little bit skeptical. I'm the kind of person who needs to witness it for herself. I guess I had just hoped to see something. As I turned, ready to follow my best friend away from this way too black darkness, something caught my eye. It was a light, coming from the woods. I whipped around, and my feet were set in stone, like concrete. Every ounce of blood seeped from my body, and my lungs felt deflated. Between two trees stood, or floated, a figure. A woman in a white dress, only the woman herself was also as white as snow, with a soft white glow surrounding her. Her hair cascaded over her shoulders. She wasn't moving. I couldn't even see a face. Casey could see it too. As quickly as she came, the woman disappeared, as if somebody flicked off a light switch. The glow vanished, leaving Casey and I in complete darkness that seemed somehow darker than before. We bolted out of there, neither of us saying a word. I ran so fast I nearly tumbled down the hill. With a strong desire to flee, I wouldn't have been against it. It would have gotten me to the bottom a lot quicker, albeit with some scrapes and bruises, but I would have gladly taken the chance. When we made it back to our friends, we told them what we saw. A woman, as white as snow, wearing a white dress and glowing white. Marissa replied with, The light that I saw was yellow, not white. Neither Sarah nor Marissa believed us. Casey and I defended our case, and the argument went on and on until we reached Sarah's house. 
By the end of it, Sarah and Marissa still weren't convinced, though Marissa went on about the light she swore she saw. To be completely honest, Casey and I started to doubt what we had witnessed. Eventually, our experience morphed into tricks of the eyes from internalized paranoia and fear. We couldn't even tell our parents, since they didn't know that we were walking around town at night, and we had no intentions of ratting ourselves out. Casey and I stopped talking about it, and soon the memory faded. Flash forward three years. We were in high school. On a Saturday, I was with my other friend, Marissa, a different Marissa from earlier, and we were loitering at the local ice cream shop, as most locals did. We sat at an outside table, talking. After a while of some catching up, she goes, My friend told me this creepy story the other day. Want to hear it? As a huge fan of horror, I told her to go for it. She shifted in her seat, facing me, her eyes wide. It's about Evergreen. The cemetery? My friend said it's haunted, that the stories go back decades. Can you believe that? When the words left her lips, my spine straightened. I felt every hair on the back of my neck stand up. I didn't want to believe her, so I immediately dismissed the issue. That's when she took a deep breath and said, No, oh, it's true. A woman appears in the woods at the far end of the cemetery, usually right between those two really big trees, you know? They call her the woman in white. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we have had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, etc. We have had paranormal investigators to our house, and were waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands, and went back out to do the laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen, and saw what he thought was me in the hallway with no clothes on. He called my name and said that she turned her face toward him and gave a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column but from the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to and said that he couldn't see me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub, unaware of all of this. He made me swear left and right that I hadn't left the bathtub. He was very freaked out, and he made us follow him from room to room the rest of the night, and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months ago. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said that she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. She also told me before to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. I really hope it works. So this happened around five to six years ago to my uncle. He works for a big company, which has offices all over the country, so he's been transferred a few times. This one time he was transferred to a big city, so he rented a big truck to move his furniture and other household items. They finished the packing by evening and decided to start the journey by 7 p.m. in the night so that they could reach their destination by morning. My father was accompanying him. So they started their journey. By around 2 or 3 a.m., around 2 or 3 a.m., the truck driver slowed the truck a bit, so my uncle and my father asked what happened. He said that there was a lady standing ahead and that she might be asking for help and that we should check and make sure everything was okay. My uncle said, no, don't stop. We don't have time for all this, just keep going. He insisted, but my uncle didn't let him stop. So when they reached their destination, he was a bit angry with my uncle and father. He said, why wouldn't you have let me help that woman? My uncle said, the thing is, there was no woman on the road. We didn't see any woman standing there. Only you could see her, but we didn't want to tell you this because otherwise you might have been scared, and that would have been bad since we were driving on the highway in the night. A 
A little background for clarity. My daughter is currently three and a half. She was an early talker, and because I work from home, typically after she goes to sleep or while my parents watch her, she's not in daycare and is mostly around adults. So she's always had a pretty advanced vocabulary and is a great communicator. She's intermittently said creepy things before from an early age, and everyone kind of warily laughs it off. I myself have always been keen to believe in the paranormal, so the things she says tend to rattle me a bit. But the following conversation was by far the most detailed, coherent, and startling account to date. Oh, it's probably also important to note that my daughter has only ever experienced the death of my parents' dog. I say that to say that we've never had to explain to her that people die. So I don't know that she would have been able to realize that based on what she's experienced or been exposed to. We don't watch shows where people die, we don't watch violent movies, but I also wouldn't put it past her to put it together. Anyway, we were cleaning her room one day and I had a pile of hangers on the floor so I could hang up her laundry. She's into construction and has a pretty vivid imagination and likes to pretend that hangers are hooks on construction cranes and things like that. So she grabbed a couple of hangers, hopped up on her bed, and started hanging them on the rail. I was just watching her out of the corner of my eye because that wasn't unusual for her. But then she said, the captain used to make me hang hooks. I immediately stopped hanging her shirt and watched her for a moment as she was casually adjusting her hanger hooks as if what she'd said was completely normal. I somewhat hesitantly asked her who the captain was. She went on to say that she had died before, when she was an old man. Her grandson, the captain, was a mean man and scared her, so they didn't talk a lot. Then when she was old, she lived with him and he hurt her a lot. She said that she died and that's how she came to live with me now. She said all of this while continuing to play on her bed like nothing was out of the ordinary. But then she stopped and she looked at me deadpan and said, The captain still comes at night to see me here sometimes. He tries to hurt me again, but you scare him away. I was aghast and said some sort of comforting remark that I can't remember. And she wasn't any more forthcoming after that. It's worth noting that she's had intermittent night terrors most of her life. She will wake suddenly, crying out as if she were in pain. It's always been a very distinct cry, different from when she would cry because she was upset, or hungry, or cut her knee, and different from when she would awaken during the night under normal circumstances. It was more of a guttural and heart-wrenching cry, the kind of sobs that come from deep within a person. When she was an infant, she had colic and was very gassy, so she would also end up in fits from the pain. It was a similar fit to her night terrors, but as she's gotten older, she's lost her infant wail and grown out of her digestive issues, so the cry has become even more out of the ordinary. I've always been the one to go to her when she wakes up, so on her bad nights I rush down the hall, knowing by her cry what to expect. She writhes on the bed, her little muscles so tense that she feels like she's made of stone. She'll arch her back, stretching her arms and legs out as far and as tightly as she can before pulling herself into a ball, over and over again for several minutes. From what I've read about night terrors, I don't think she's coherent during her episodes, but if she is, she's too overcome to acknowledge me. Early on, I thought I could just wake her, and then once she came to, I'd be able to comfort her, as I would any normal night. I would lift her out of her crib and try to get her to nurse or take a bottle or just be held. But even as an infant, the manner and the strength with which her body contorted was extreme enough that I would have to lay her on the carpet for fear that trying to restrain her would injure her. Nothing I do to console her receives a response or seems to do anything to lessen her fits. She'll simply carry on full steam until, just as suddenly as it all started, she'll calm down. Sometimes she just drifts back off into a peaceful sleep without ever opening her eyes. 
Other times, she'll pull me in to hold her, or wake briefly to ask why I'm in the room, as if nothing happened. Now that she's older, I ask her in the morning if she remembers waking up or having a bad dream, and she never does. I had always attributed her night terrors to the typical textbook assumption that they're simply a child's growing brain, processing the stress and anxiety of understanding their world. But after hearing about the captain and my presence scaring him away, I don't think I'll ever be able to look at these nights the same way again. I just can't shake the feeling that she didn't just make up some complex, beyond her years narrative that coincidentally happens to provide a more sinister explanation of her night terrors. I have no idea if anybody else has experienced anything similar, but I'm kind of at a loss. My house was built in 1904. It is a single family home wood frame setting on a concrete block foundation. I've been living here for about 12 years. Of all the weird things that my siblings and I have seen and heard in this house, this one event is my favorite. This happened to my brother. About 10 years ago, my brother and his best friends had started a garage band playing mostly Spanish rock, alternative music, but in Spanish. His friends could only get together on Sunday afternoons. They would practice into the early evening. They would usually call it quits by about 8 p.m. This was the time I usually showed up and went to bed, because I worked the graveyard shift. This happened in late fall, so the days were getting shorter. They had just finished a long session when the decision to head to somebody else's house came about. My brother handed his car keys to his buddy so that they could load up the equipment. Everyone had filed out of the basement. The tricky part was, they needed to walk all the way to the back of the basement, up the back stairs, through the kitchen doorway, down the hall into the living room, and out into the front porch. Everybody was outside, sitting in my brother's truck waiting for him. My brother was walking up the back stairs when he remembered that he had left his pancakes in a to-go container, sitting on a speaker in the basement. He made the decision to go back. Now, the basement is not clean, with full sight lines. There had been partitions made, and the boiler and main heating unit are right smack in the middle. So after my brother walks back, he's about to retrieve his food container, when out of the corner of his eye, he sees it. It's a shadowy figure, right at his peripheral vision. This feeling of dread and uneasiness washed over my brother. We had been taught that if you're in the presence of a spirit or a ghost and you felt a bad vibe, to say a quick prayer or to swear at it. My brother chose the latter. My brother started to walk to the back of the basement after telling off the presence and briskly up the stairs, closing doors and turning off lights as he was walking out. The last light switch is on the opposite side of the front door. Luckily, the door was open, and the light from the street lamp was flooding the living room with its amber light. My brother said he felt something at his back, but at no point did he turn around. As he flicked off that last switch, the living room went dark, as the rest of the house. As he stepped out, he pulled on the door, closing it behind him, still holding his food container in one hand. He jogged down the few porch steps, walked towards the front gate, now our house resides far from the main street, essentially having a large front yard but no rear garage. As he closed the gap between himself and his friend-laden truck, he kind of smiled and thought things over in his head, mad at himself for freaking out when there was clearly no reason to. He climbs into the driver's side of the truck and puts on his seatbelt, getting ready to pull out of the parking spot directly in front of the house. When one of his friends goes, Hey, wait, what about your brother? Isn't he coming with us? My brother answered, What do you mean? He went to work early tonight. He's already gone. Do you see his car anywhere? The next question that they asked was, Well, then who was walking behind you when you were leaving the house? When I was 11, I went to the Philippines with my mom to meet my family for a few weeks. 
The stay was pretty normal, nothing strange going on, except for one night. I remember it because it was blistering hot, and I was constantly sweating on the bed. The place we were staying at was my grandmother's home, a small two-story house, with about nine people living there, mainly my mom, sister, and her family. The room that my mom and I shared had no door, and had a view to a balcony at the end of a hallway. On the night in question, I woke up for no reason. It was pretty late, around 3 a.m. My bed had a perfect view of the hallway, all the way to the balcony, and standing there was a boy, or what I assume was a boy. At first, I thought it was my cousin, Jeebi, and so I asked him, Hey, why are you up? I got no response, rolled over, and went back to sleep. But this nagging feeling kept bugging me, and I realized that it got kind of cold. Though not freezing, it was noticeably cooler and more comfortable now, compared to how hot it had been. So I roll back over and I notice the boy is still standing there, and that's when alarm bells begin going off. Jeebi, go to bed, you're freaking me out, I yell. The sound of my voice wakes my mom up, and she looks at me asking why I was yelling in the middle of the night, saying that I was going to wake the whole neighborhood. At this point, I tell her to tell GB to go to bed because he's bothering me. She looks confused and said, GB is asleep, what do you mean? I said, look by the balcony, he's right there, don't you see him? I point down the hall at the boy, who this entire time just stood there watching us. My mom thinks I'm playing some kind of game, and goes, There's no one there. Go to bed. At this point, I'm freaking out, and I beg my mom to make sure my cousin is in bed. Seeing how distraught I am, she got up and went to look. She turns on the light to the hallway. Mind you, the boy is still there watching. She walks down the hallway through the boy and goes to check on her sister and her kids and confirms they were all there. She walks back to the room again, walking through him once more. At this point, I realized that the boy had no face, and I just kind of shut down. My mom then remarked on how it was a little chilly that night and she hoped that I didn't get sick since the clothes I wore were wet with sweat. Then she just turned off the hallway lights laid back down and went to sleep. I just stared at the boy in horror, too young to realize what was going on. I felt like I was in some kind of weird staring contest. Eventually, I blinked, and it was gone. I tried telling everybody what I saw in the morning, but none of my aunts, uncles, or cousins even cared. Though my mom was kind of freaked out by it, because she is a believer in the supernatural, it was my grandmother who supplied answers. You probably saw your grandfather, she tells me after she finishes listening to my story. He did something like that with your sister when she came a few years ago. He always likes to tease. He did when he was alive, and he does now. Don't be too bothered by it. Consider it good luck. Honestly, I still don't know how to feel about it. All of my grandparents died before I was born, but I've always felt a strong connection to my maternal grandmother. I have some of her rings, and I feel like she's always close. Not only do I have a lot of similar mannerisms to her, as well as a medium confirming that she's always with me, we also have my paternal grandfather's ashes in our lounge, and my paternal grandmother was a medium. However, this is about my paternal grandmother. My father was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's, about a year and a little bit ago. Recently he's been getting a lot worse. Dementia has kicked in to such a severe degree that he doesn't remember the fact that I've actually moved out. He always asks where I've gone when I'm not in the house. He also has many falls, some of which leave him to spending hours at a time on the floor. I'm currently staying home to make sure he's okay and he now has it arranged that he has daily, if not twice daily, visits from nurses. He actually finds it difficult to talk about his parents. This used to be because he found it difficult, 
in general, but now he can't remember. So the first week I came home, I had a really vivid dream where all of my family had to share a bedroom because there was someone trying to harm us in the house. I heard someone, a male, whistling in the kitchen. I knew this was my paternal grandfather. I don't know why I knew this, something just told me. Then I saw someone walk up our stairs. I saw their silhouette and heard them come up the stairway. Then my paternal grandmother came into the room. She sat on the end of my bed and took my hand, and she looked at my dad and said one thing, please make sure he's okay. He needs to be okay. He's not okay, but he needs to be. I love him. Make sure he's okay. Please, I trust you. And then I woke up. Confused, I was thinking it was just a dream. However, last week, about two weeks after my dream, I was awoken in my bed. I figured it was my cats. It's always my cats. So I looked to my feet, as something had just sat on them. I looked up, and there was a figure. A human figure. Not a full shadow, but slightly translucent. I couldn't tell who, but they seemed to have their hair up in a bun, the way my grandmothers both used to wear their hair. They were muttering something, which is the main thing that woke me sat on the end of my bed, on my feet, just muttering. Now I was half asleep, and I wasn't 100% sure at that time that it wasn't my cat, because maybe they grew 50 times over the night. So I just said, can you move please? I want to move my legs. So they did. The figure got up and left. The next morning I woke up, not sure if it was a dream or not. Then I tried to walk. My feet were completely dead and bruised, as if they'd been harmed in some way, as though they'd been sat on for a long period of time. This happened just a few weeks ago. I work at an after-school daycare center for elementary-aged kids. We work out of a portable building outside the school. On this day, all of the kids were outside for recess. This doesn't happen often, as the older and younger kids have different schedules most days, so some kids and one teacher are almost always there. Well, we forgot to bring outside the medicine for one of our epileptic kids, which is a big no-no, and as I'm just an aide, my boss sent me back to the building to grab it and come back. No big deal. I walk into the building and start heading to the backpack, when I see what I can only describe as a ball rolling across the floor. It came out of the hallway and moved toward my boss's desk. The thing was pitch black, with hints of purple, and it moved silently. The entire building was dead silent except for my breathing, but still, I couldn't hear this thing. At first I thought it was just a ball, but we don't have any balls inside. At that time, they were outside with all of the kids, then I thought, maybe I had seen a mouse or something. But upon looking at the area where the thing had stopped moving, I didn't find anything. I'm religious, and I remember hearing that many spirits will leave if they hear a person say Jesus' name. So I started sort of chanting his name as I went and used the bathroom, then grabbed the bag. I wasn't exactly scared, but my heart was racing, and I was definitely uneasy. I grabbed what I needed and left in a hurry, and didn't think about it again until just the other day. I have no idea what I saw. I've never seen or even heard of anything like it before. I suppose it's possible that I was just seeing things, but I swear, this ball was so real, and then it just wasn't there. I'm a teenage girl from Mexico. A month or so ago, our school took us on a field trip to Nacapule Canyon in San Carlos, Sonora. There were two groups with one guide and two teachers each. My friend Michelle and I were in the second group. On the way down, we stopped for some photos and to have a rest, so the first group was way ahead of us. Eventually, Michelle and I began descending, following the voices of the first group. 
At some point, we lost track and we were absolutely lost. I've never experienced such a dreadful feeling like that. I felt lightheaded. Everything was eerily quiet, and the only thing I could hear were the occasional mosquitoes or rocks moving around. I had this horrible anxiety. I felt like I was going to start crying right there in the middle of nowhere. We spent like half an hour there, on a rock, but it felt like an eternity to me. I recently read about this phenomenon called panic in the woods. It seems really similar to what I experienced that day in Nakapule. It's not only my first paranormal experience, but my family has a slight reaction with paranormal stuff. So, maybe it's something paranormal, or maybe it's psychological. All I know is that we definitely felt panicked that day. We felt like things were all around us, even though we were in the middle of nowhere, and I still can't explain it. When I was in my early 20s, I worked in a live-in group home for mentally disabled adults, most of which were low-functioning, really hardcore stuff. The house had been in this company for years, and there had been several deaths that had happened there. It was just a normal old house, would never know driving past it on the street. It was very homey and comfortable, and the staff there and myself kept it that way. Plot twist. I began working the graveyard shift by myself, right after starting as a direct support professional. I would work from 9pm until 7am by myself. At 7 a.m., I would have another DSP show up and help me send them off to a day program. After my first week, I began avoiding doing clients' laundry overnight. The laundry room was in the basement and would always give me an uneasy feeling. Keep in mind, I'm a 6 foot tall, 300 pound, 20 year old tatted man. But still, something about that place gave me the creeps. I started to stay late off the clock to do the client's laundry after my shift. After doing this a couple of times, my coworker, who I replaced on the graveyard shift so he could take days, took notice and asked me why I had been staying late to do laundry. I told him why, very embarrassed, and he just smiled and laughed. He proceeded to tell me about him also doing the same thing. He and several family members had worked at this particular location for years. He told me once about going down into the basement and falling halfway down the stairs. He said he could never know for sure, but he always felt like he had been pushed. Since then, neither him or anyone in his family would do the laundry at night. He then told me about all the experiences that he and others had had there. As weeks went by working there, there was always somebody up causing a ruckus, so I never really felt alone at night. The first time I saw something was a normal night. I was watching Comedy Central, cooking their lunch for the next day in the kitchen. All their bedrooms were in the back hallway of the house. While I was cooking, I had opened the fridge and saw somebody walking through the hallway to the bathroom. I paused what I was doing and put on a pair of gloves to go assist in a brief change or help the client use the toilet, whatever they needed. So I get my gloves on and walk to the bathroom. I walk in and the light is off and no one's in there. So I start thinking that it's my non-verbal client. I'm saying things like, hey, where are you? I go and open her door and she and her roommate are asleep. So I go and check the boy's room and they're asleep. Then I go check on our wild child and she was tucked into her bed. Confusion quickly turned into fear and panic. I ran outside and called my friend who had gotten me the job and told him what had happened. He laughed it off and wasn't surprised. So pretty much I got this job and everyone in the place knew that it was haunted but never decided to tell me. I continued working there for a year and a half. Situations like the one above happened often. I began speaking out loud whenever I would feel uneasy, telling things to leave me alone and to go to bed, looking like a crazy person. 
We had gotten a new client who was a bully, and that's an understatement. He would terrorize his roommates, was very violent and unforgiving. He would often wail to me from his room late at night about being touched and hit and woken up in his sleep. His roommate, who had lived there for over 10 years, would always tell me and the other client that it was Kelly. Kelly was his old roommate who had passed away about a year prior to me getting the job. This violent client would always beat up his roommate, who was very good friends with Kelly. He would always tell him that's what you get for hitting me. One night, this client had a particularly bad night and we ended up having to have him arrested. When these guys get arrested, they really just take them to the hospital for a few hours until they chill out and then they're brought back before too long. So he was gone before my shift started one night. I got a call around 2 a.m. saying that they were going to come and drop him off. They were doing so in an ambulance. He was a big dude in a wheelchair. I was sitting in the living room on the couch while I was on the phone with my boss. Right after I got off the phone, a client came into the kitchen to ask who I was talking to. I told her it was Terry and that this client was going to be coming home soon. As soon as I finished the sentence, the hanging blinds to the sliding glass door on the patio pushed wide open and began swinging like they were split and dropped. I looked at the client that was in my kitchen and she just laughed and said, Oh, you, and walked away. I worked there for a year and a half and was never in a position where I felt truly in danger. But I always felt like I was walking on eggshells. It was a great job and taught me a lot. I honestly feel like every young adult should have to work in that line of work for some amount of time. But if you're trying to get your friend a job somewhere, especially overnight, and you know the place is haunted, maybe let them know beforehand. I love a good scary story, a good horror movie, and I absolutely love exchanging ghost stories. I'm a firm believer in the supernatural. I'm a green witch and Wiccan, of course, so it's in my blood. All my life, as long as I can remember, I've loved anything to do with ghosts and hauntings. It's my dream to be one of those YouTube paranormal investigators like Mindseed. And lucky me, I've had a few experiences myself. So I haven't been able to go exploring to haunted places as much as I would love to. But this experience happened in a house I lived in with my family years ago, in a place called Stevensville, in Newfoundland, Canada. I was still in the early elementary school ages, quite young. I had the big room adjoined with the living room. The living room was just right outside my door, and these were the only two places that had carpet. So back then, I used to have quite a lot of times where I would have trouble sleeping. My go-to when that happened was books. I had these little finger lights hidden everywhere so that I wouldn't have to turn on the room light and let my parents know that I was reading instead of sleeping. I really was obsessed with reading. If I stayed up past bedtime reading, the books would be taken away as a punishment. Another side note, in my room, there was what looked like a trap door, which led to an attic, but it was painted over. We never went up there. So one night, I couldn't get to sleep. And I remember that the book of choice for that night was a Guinness Book of World's Record books. I loved stuff like that. Also Ripley's Believe It or Not, horror books, things like that. It was well past midnight because both of my parents were asleep and they stayed up pretty late. Like any normal night, I kept on hearing creaking on my ceiling as if somebody was walking around. Keep in mind, this is only a one-story house and the only way to the attic was through my room, but nobody had touched that door in years upon years, and the owners of the house we rented never mentioned it. I heard these creakings all the time, so I'd gotten pretty used to it. But later on that night, I heard a door open and close in the direction of my parents' room, and I heard what sounded like bare footsteps on a hard floor directly outside of my bedroom door. 
as somebody walked to the bathroom. Me, as a kid, thinking that it was my mom, went out to go tell her that I was having trouble sleeping. The footsteps were lighter, and she was the kind parent, so I assumed it was her, and that's why I felt comfortable telling her. But when I went out there, I saw no one. No one in the kitchen. No one in the bathroom. And that's when I started to hear these faint whispers, and I started getting a little creeped out. I went back to my room, and that's when it hit me. There's carpet in front of my room. I should never have been able to hear footsteps on a hard floor in front of my door. At that point, I ran back in my room, and I ended up going to school the next day with no sleep. That is the most prominent ghostly memory that I have of that house, but there were other things that happened often. For instance, we had black mold all the time. Yes, the mold that's really bad for your health. Like, no matter what we did, it would come back, and worse. Especially in the room that I was in. We couldn't have furniture against the wall because of it. We got rid of it once, but then it showed up, and that cycle kept repeating. The TV kept turning on and off on its own for no reason, too. Despite all of this, though, it's still one of my favorite childhood houses, and I really do miss it. A few years ago, I owned a recording studio in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in the basement of the old Woolworths building. My brother-in-law ran a snowboard shop up on the main floor, and the basement had a room that I used to record musicians. The whole basement couldn't be kept lit. I would buy light bulbs every week to replace the ones that had popped. One room would stay somewhat lit, so I set up shop in there. There were many experiences that were unexplainable, but one stands out above the rest. I had finished recording a band that evening, and they all packed up and left. I locked the door behind them and watched them drive away. Going back down to the studio in the basement, I went to start mixing the audio. About 20 minutes into the process, I stopped the music for a second to adjust some things and heard running down the stairs to the basement, then frantic running down the hallway toward my room. I had left the door open. I looked down the hallway to see what was going on. There was absolutely nothing there. I was quite freaked out, but I really needed to get the mixes done, so I went back to work and tried hard to concentrate on the music. About five minutes later, the exact same thing happened except this time I ran to the hallway to catch the cause of the noise. So there I am, staring down this darkened hallway, hearing something frantically running toward me, and there's nothing there that I can see. I checked the entire basement, which scared the crap out of me, because there was only one light still working in the rest of the basement. I found nothing and no one. I went and checked the door upstairs, locked. I went back to the studio and decided to put on some headphones to keep the creepiness out. Well, that didn't work at all because as I was mixing, I could feel a horribly angry presence behind me. In my mind, I could see exactly what the presence looked like. It was a very angry, bald Asian man, about 40-ish. I kept looking behind me, but nothing. Soon the man felt like he was standing right over me. His fists clenched and up over his head like he was going to hit me. I turned around and saw a door down the hallway, closed slightly, all on its own. That was it. I was out. I packed up my studio the next week and never went back. After studying a bit about the history of the area, I came to find out that there was what was dubbed the Chinese Massacre on that same street about a hundred years ago. It was where a bunch of Chinese railway workers were killed by local folks for, quote, taking their jobs. So crazy. A couple of weeks ago in my psychology class, my friend Sarah decided that we should do a Ouija board. We were really bored and the teacher doesn't care what we do. So we made our own. 
We drew out a Ouija board on the back of a piece of paper and cut out a planchette. By this point, a few of my other friends, let's call them Aaron, Anna, and B, decided that they wanted to join in. So we all put our hands on the board and asked if anybody was there. The planchette didn't move, and we figured it was because of the friction between paper and paper. So we got Aaron to hold the board so that only the planchette moved. We asked again if anybody was there. It started moving toward the yes very slowly. I swear that I was not moving it. Sarah, Anna, and B all swore that they weren't moving it either. I've been friends with them for a really long time, so I would know when they're lying. Once it got to the yes, Sarah asked if it was a bad or a good spirit, but just as it was about to move, Anna grabbed the board and ripped it up. I don't know hardly anything about Ouija boards, but I do know that that probably isn't a good thing to do. Later that day, Sarah burned the board. We never said goodbye. That's when the creepy stuff started to happen. B texted me in the morning and said that she woke up in the middle of the night at exactly 4 a.m. and felt like there was someone standing behind her. I told her that it was probably just her mind making things up. When I got to school that morning, Sarah came up to me and said that something really weird happened in the night. She then said that she woke up and felt like someone was standing behind her. I asked her what time this was, and she said it was around 4 a.m. I told her B's experience, and she genuinely looked shocked. I could tell that was news to her. Also, Sarah and B don't really talk that much. Skip forward a bit, and it's Saturday night. Suddenly, I get a voice message from B, and it's really creepy. She has a very strong Spanish accent, but in the voice message, she sounded British. I had no idea what she was saying, but it didn't sound like English or Spanish. Then she started laughing, and it wasn't a normal laugh. It was a creepy, deep laugh that I honestly thought she was faking. I started texting her, saying, Are you okay? And what's going on? She started to text back with really bad spelling saying that there was blood and she couldn't see. I asked her where the blood was and she didn't reply. Honestly, she sounded possessed. After a while, she stopped texting and I guessed that she went to bed. On Monday, when I went back to school, I asked her about it and she had no idea what I was talking about. She said she doesn't remember anything about it. I kept bringing it up with her, but she would just say, I can't remember, and immediately changed the subject. Side note, I can't remember which night this was, but one night I woke up and looked at the clock, and it was exactly 4 a.m. Also, a week later, I was in math class with Aaron, and we opened the fire exit door because it was really hot. I glanced outside and could have sworn I saw a guy wearing a coat with a hood standing close to the school staring at the classroom. I did a double take, but when I looked back, he was gone. The past few weeks after that, nothing much happened. Then, today, we had psychology again. B wasn't there because she was in Spain, and when she was there, she found out that she has a dangerous blood clot close to her heart, and she would have to have surgery to get it removed, which means she can't fly back to England. Sarah decided that we should play the Charlie Charlie game. We got two pencils and put them on top of each other and drew yes and no on the table. We asked it if Charlie was there and it slowly spun a bit to the yes. It could have just been a breeze or someone getting up or something, but that was still a little bit creepy. We started talking about Anna and said something about Charlie Bear, which is a children's television show and the top pencil spun around really quickly and fell apart. There was no breeze, no movement, nothing that could have made the pencil spin. Sarah, for some reason, asked Charlie to kill her and then asked if Charlie hated me. 
the pencil spun slowly to yes. At this point, I started to feel really sick and scared. For some reason, I kept saying, please forgive me, Charlie, please forgive me. And as I was in the middle of saying that, the pencils spun really quickly and then stopped and the pencils aligned. Then the top pencil toppled off the bottom one and that's when we stopped playing. Now I'm sitting at home with an incense stick burning, hoping that Sarah doesn't die and that I don't get haunted. I have no idea what to do. When I was 11, my dad, my sister, and I moved into a townhouse. At night, I would wake up and see two different men, they were different every night, walk into my room. My room was right next to the bathroom, which is where the two men would walk in from. One would have a top hat and a tailcoat. The other wore dark sunglasses and a trench coat, but the silhouettes would change. It would creep me out so much that I would hide under my covers. Sometimes I got too scared and slept in my dad's bed. One night I was sleeping in my dad's room and two identical twin girls with long black hair and hollowed out eyes came up to my dad while he slept. They didn't say anything, they just stared at him and then they went away. Our neighbor John told me that I could see ghosts. I've been told I'm a medium, but I block it out as an adult. I'm 20 now. In John's house, I saw a woman hanging by the neck in his kitchen, and then in the basement, a man with a cleaver dripping in blood. I was so scared that I left. Now I'm 20 and I still believe in ghosts. People tell me that I should develop my gift, but I don't know if I want to develop it any more than it already has. This is a family story that happened sometime in the late 80s, I believe. For context, I have a huge family, German, Irish, Catholic. And growing up, we always had big family parties for birthdays, holidays, and other events. My mom, Several aunts, grandma, and great-grandma were at my grandma's house cleaning up after a party late at night. It was probably 10 or 11. My great-grandma went to bed. She lived with my grandparents due to dementia and the lack of resources for the elderly during that time. My great-grandma came out to the living room in her nightgown and said, There's a man outside of my window. Understandably disturbed, a few of the group go into her room and look outside the window. The backyard is not very large. It was mostly ivy and gardens. There is an iron bench with a vintage lamp post next to it. It had a very early 1900s look to it. There was no sign of anyone outside. Chalking it up to dementia, my grandma said, There's no one there. It's okay. Go back to bed. The group continued cleaning while listening to music and goofing around. My great-grandma came out again and said there was a man outside her window. The group walked back into her bedroom to look out the window once more. There was an exchange between my grandma and my great-grandma. Where is the man that you're seeing? My grandma asked. He just knocked on the window. He wants me to come outside, said my great-grandmother. What does he look like? asked my grandma. Oh, he's very handsome. He's wearing an all-white suit with a top hat and white shoes. He wants me to come outside and meet the lady. What lady? My grandma asked her. The pretty lady on the bench. Don't you see her? She's wearing a very nice pink dress. At this point, my mom, aunts, and grandma are pretty freaked out. They turn on every light and search the backyard. There's no sign of anyone or of anyone having been there. Everyone decides that her dementia is progressing faster than they thought and they called it a night. The next morning, my grandma gets a phone call from some family in California. They were calling to say that my great grandma's sister had passed the night before. My grandma was obviously upset, especially because as far as she knew, her aunt was in relatively good health. My grandma composed herself and asked, 
Was she sick? What happened? The family member from California said, Not as far as we know, but she must have known it was coming. Why do you say that? My grandma asked. Because she fell asleep in her bed that night, wearing her favorite pink dress. This just happened to me, and I've been up for the past hour, panicked. I woke up at 3.15, on the dot, and checked my phone. I stretched, yawned, and laid there for about 10 minutes, not feeling a hint of being scared. So right now, I'm sleeping on the pullout in the living room with my girlfriend. My sister is in her room, and there's an empty bedroom with bathrooms attached. So I'm facing the whole apartment, if that makes sense. Where I'm laying, I can see the dining room, half of the kitchen, and the very small hallway where the three doors are to the rooms. Mind you, I'm wide awake, scrolling on my phone, and I roll over to face the wall and the window. I'm not laying there more than five minutes when I hear creaking, like a door, even though, like I just said, everyone's asleep. I brush it off, thinking it was the heat. That's when I hear clear as day, right in the room, a girl's voice say, hello? I whip around on the bed, but I see absolutely nothing. I listened really hard, which is easy to do in a dead silent apartment, and all I hear is my sister snoring. I know the voice wasn't my sister's, as it sounded nothing like her, but trying to calm myself down I just tell myself that my sister's talking in her sleep. So I lay back down, and this time I face the apartment again, with my back to the wall. I rest my head on my pillow, and again begin to scroll on my phone. That's when I hear what I would call a goblin-like voice. That's all I can imagine. Something grumbled and high-pitched, and it wasn't like a significant word or phrase, but just a jumble of words and syllables. I instantly felt sick. It was a feeling of anxiety and dread and fear all at once. I've had paranormal experiences before where I believe I've seen a ghost in the apartment, but I would have to say that this was the most terrifying thing to ever happen to me. It was just about an hour ago, and I know exactly what I heard. It almost sounded like a laugh, if that makes sense. I don't want to sound like I'm making this up because I'm not, but it almost sounded like a different language, like it had an internal consistency. I'm planning on going and getting sage today, to go around the house and say some prayers, and whatever I can do. I did check on my sister twice, just to make sure nothing was in there, and she was okay. She was sound asleep the whole time. I woke my girlfriend up and we walked around the apartment just to be safe. I'm absolutely sure of what I heard, and I think that's what terrifies me the most. If someone has any idea of an explanation, I'd love to hear it to ease my mind. So this happened a few months back, when I happened to be in the bathroom. I was singing that Willow Smith song. You know, that wait a minute song, minding my own business. I got to the point in the song where she quotes a phrase said in the Avatar movie in their language. And while I'm singing it, I'm thinking to myself at the same time, hmm, I wonder what that actually means, translated into English. As I finish singing the line and simultaneously trying to recall what it translated to, a female disembodied voice said, no you can't. I shut up immediately and paused a second, shocked. It sounded as if somebody was speaking into a tin can, but very clearly, and only a few feet away. I left the bathroom completely weirded out, and after a few minutes, I remembered about wanting to know what that phrase meant. I googled it and found out that it meant, I see you, in English. I was and am still blown away. By this strange experience. 
This happened to me around six years back when I was visiting family in Alaska. I was borrowing a car to go visit some family when I lost control on a two-lane highway and hit a tree. I was freezing cold and there was no point in staying in my car because the windows were smashed. I was scared. It was night and I had no way of calling for help. When I saw some headlights coming down the highway, I got out an emergency light and flagged the person down. It turned out to be some old Max Semi. A big guy opened the door and let me in. He asked if I was right and I told him I was fine, but I had crashed and I thanked him very much for helping me out of the cold. I told him my name and he said that his name was Bill. He ended up dropping me off in a small town 10 miles ahead and told me he had to go. I thanked him again and I went inside a small restaurant. I told him that some trucker named Bill helped me out. They all got a very strange look. They told me that that was impossible because the only trucker who drove those roads named Bill had died in an accident six years prior to that day. I got chills. It's very weird and I still don't believe in ghosts, but mine and the bartender's descriptions matched perfectly. No matter what I do, I can't disprove what happened that night. In case anyone was wondering, the bartender said that Bill had jackknifed on the highway to avoid someone who spun out on the road. Alaska drivers, please be careful. When I was around 10, my family decided to make the change to move to a small town in Northern California along with my grandparents. Since the moment we moved there, I always thought the place was strange. I have a younger brother, and for the majority of the time we lived in the new house, he would act somewhat odd. He would often be playing with an imaginary friend, and my parents and I always blew it off as him just being young, who didn't have one. But some of the things he would say would leave us pondering who or what he was actually interacting with. For the most part, whenever we would ask him who he was playing with, he would always say it was his friend, or more disturbingly, his dead brother. I was always left in awe, since as far as I knew, it was just the two of us. I even questioned my parents if they had lost any children and they always denied it. At times when it was time to go to sleep, my brother would refuse because he was playing with his friend and on one occasion, he asked if his friend could sleep next to him. He was still young, so he slept in my parents' room. My mom was somewhat done with him talking about his friend, so he told him to tell his friend to get the hell out of there. The moment she said that, the show she was watching on TV turned to pure static. She got terrified and immediately tried to turn off her television. It wouldn't shut off or change channels, and she was left with having to unplug it in order to cut the noise off. For the rest of the night, she was completely unable to go to sleep, and she told me her experience on the way to drop me off at the bus stop. There's also a local Chinese cemetery close to where we live, and a lot of times my brother would always say that that's where his dead brother lived. I often had to tell him to stop saying things like that, since it spooked my mom and me. Once he started to get older, he stopped playing with his friend, and other things around the house started to happen. At times, you could hear whispers in the home. Sometimes doors would close by themselves. You would hear walking outside by the windows. As I got older and I started high school, we moved over to the neighboring town, and my grandparents bought the house that we lived in. My uncle was recently divorced and he moved back in with my grandparents, so he was often home. My parents, being Mexican, always had their ritual of going to Mexico to go home to visit family during the holidays. So on one occasion, I decided not to go with them and my uncle was left to look after me. It was just us at the house and he had the knack of staying up all night and watching TV. So I only saw him after I got home. Me having to be up early in the morning would just be lounging around the house, waiting for it to be time for me to walk to the bus stop. On one of these mornings, I decided it was a good idea to get up close and personal to an angel figurine my grandmother had in the room I was staying in. 
As my face got closer to it, all of a sudden I heard a loud, hey, in front of me. It startled me so badly that I jumped up and almost fell on my back. I had no explanation as to what had just happened, so I rushed over to my uncle's room thinking it was a prank. I tried to go into his room, but I wasn't able to since it was locked. Having no explanation, I just decided to leave and wait outside. That was my last experience there at the house. My grandparents sold the house and moved to the same town we live in now, and all of these things were somewhat forgotten. Many years later, me being 23 now and working at a warehouse for an electronics company, made a friend with a person who also happened to have gone to the same trade school that I had attended. On one occasion, just chatting, we started to talk about paranormal things. He started to tell me how his younger sister had an imaginary friend, and strange things happened at his house. I was kind of a jokester, so I decided to play a prank on him. I knew he lived in the same town where I used to live, but I had no clue where. I started to describe my old house, and he just kept staring at me in disbelief. Until I told him, Oh, you lived at such and such a road in such and such California at this zip code. He started laughing. He said, What are you doing? Stalking me? Following me home? I was like, Wait a minute. You live there? He confirmed, and I told him that that was my childhood home. After that, I told him that my brother had also had an imaginary friend while we lived there, and also heard all the whispers that he and his brother hear coming from the walls. The doors had also closed and slammed on us. He also confirmed one thing that I had never told my parents or my brother until years later, that I had seen shadows moving around inside the house. My buddy stated that he sees them too. What got to me the most of him telling me all these things that have happened to his family there isn't that it's the same things my family experienced, that I got validation that we weren't crazy. I still talk to my buddy to this day, and he still hears and sees the same things. The last thing that reminded me about that home was an old photo my brother dug up from my parents' closet. My mother had the hobby of taking pictures of everyone and everything, so we have albums on top of albums. The picture my brother decided to take out was one where we were celebrating my brother's birthday. My uncles, brother, and myself are all posing in the picture, and in the window next to us, you can see a whitish face pressed up against the glass from the outside, and handprints on either side. Last fall, my mom was not doing so well, and it looked like she might not make it. So my wife and I traveled back to my hometown, just in case this was goodbye. We stayed at a pretty sketchy hotel while we were there because not much else was open. After coming back to the hotel for the night, we noticed that our dog didn't come to the door to greet us, which was strange. We called her and called her and nothing. My wife then saw that the bathroom door was closed. She opened it and came upon our dog in a little nest of towels, happily laying there without a care in the world. It was odd because our dog has horrible separation issues. Fast forward to the middle of the night, we were woken up by the bathroom door opening and repeatedly closing, all on its own with no cause whatsoever at least not a natural one. Once we were home, things seemed to get back to normal. However, one day my wife was sleeping in our room and I was in the living room with the dog. The bedroom door was closed. I noticed that the door to the bedroom was opening with no one being there to open it. It had been closed securely. I had even heard the click sound that it makes when it closes all the way, and I did so intentionally to give my wife quiet while she slept. Since coming home, things are pretty standard, other than the fact that our dog will now stare for prolonged periods of time down the hallway toward our laundry room at seemingly nothing. Electronics have started to turn themselves on and off, 
the fan beside me, for example, has now become known for just turning on, never off though, all on its own. So has the TV, the Apple HomePod, pretty much everything. The Apple HomePod will suddenly answer unheard questions at times of total quiet, even when no other TV or other noise sources are available. It's so strange. I think something might have followed us home. When I was about 15, my mom came home from work on a Saturday night to find my dad and I in the kitchen making dinner. She was excited because she had just gotten a promotion and had gotten the keys to her place of work, which she would be using for the first time the next morning. She put them down on the counter with her other keys and went upstairs to change. Fast forward to after dinner, my mom is getting everything organized for work the next morning and we're in the family room in the basement, picking a movie to watch. Suddenly my mom goes, has anyone seen my work keys? Immediately, my dad and I remind her that she put them on the counter when she came in. Yeah, I know, she says, but they're not there. So, of course, the three of us spent forever searching the house top to bottom for these keys. We looked in her purse, all over the kitchen, in the car, in the cupboards, pretty much anywhere we could think of. The keys were nowhere to be found. My mom concludes that they must still be at work, despite all of us having seen her bring them home and set them on the counter. She resolves to call her boss in the morning if they still haven't turned up. A little later, my mom is looking at outfits for the next day, and I'm laying on her bed playing with the cat. My mom takes a big, slightly fancier purse out of her closet, which she hasn't used in at least six months because, well, it's fancy and somewhat expensive. And in her mind, that meant it was not for everyday use. But tomorrow was special. She reaches into the purse to put her work things in it, and her hand comes back out, holding the lost keys. We were all stunned, and neither of my parents ever mentioned it again, no matter how many times I bring up the ghostly happenings in our house. First off, let me say, whether you believe this or not is of no concern to me, because I know no amount of convincing would ever have swayed me that this was something real until it happened. These are things you have to experience for yourself to be convinced sometimes. I don't have anything particularly dramatic to share. It's just a story that I need to share regardless. Shortly after my grandfather died, my siblings and I and cousins were at his house sorting things out. You know, going through the motions of losing a loved one. Out of nowhere, we all heard our grandfather say, Hello, kids. We're from the north of England. We all looked at each other like, what the fuck? It was the most bizarre thing. It sounded like it had come from outside, or like when you have earphones in with the volume set really low. I've always been the I want to believe type of skeptic, but this made me an instant believer. If it had just been me that had heard it, I would have thought that I had finally lost the plot, but all of us heard it. It turned my entire grasp of life and all of its mystery upside down. It was the first time in my life that I'd had to sit down due to the shock of learning something. I won't pretend to know just exactly what happens when we die, but... I've never been more sure of anything than I am that death is not the end. The thought of us being immortal souls terrifies me to no end, but also fascinates me to no end. It's not the most interesting story, as I warned you, but I've kept this to myself for long enough, and I hope that it's of some comfort or interest to someone. As a kid, I grew up in the country, and I was pretty much surrounded by the woods. I had some paranormal experiences that I can't explain in those woods, and the house. I was 15, I decided to go hiking in the woods on a bright summer day. It was hot out, but being in the woods I found plenty of shade. I got lost in my own angsty teen thoughts. I don't remember what I was thinking about, but 
It must have been about how city kids have fun, or boobs. It could have been either. It was probably boobs. I snapped out of it and realized I was in grass and brush that was literally over my head, and I couldn't tell where I was. I had never been in that part of the forest before, and as I looked around for anything to tell me where I was, I found nothing. For example, the stone wall that was in the eastern side of the woods, the creek that lay in a ravine to the north, or the cornfield to the west. But all I saw were trees and thick brush. When you trample through brush, you normally can see the path you took in. But oddly, there was no such path. I calmed myself and thought of what to do. I decided to head east, because the stone wall lined most of the eastern side. If I could find it, then I would be able to follow it down to a lower field and find my way back. Instead, I ended up finding the ravine that led down to the creek. But the stage, it was an old wooden structure that looked like a stage, so that's what we called it, and the field that it was in were nowhere in sight. I thought a bit that if I followed the ravine west, I would find it. That lasted ten feet when I found a really large wall of thorn bushes. South was many trees, north was the ravine with the creek blocked by thorn bushes. I'm turned around. Obviously, you've noticed that I'm not sure which is south at this point, or north, but I'm telling it from the way I was facing when I heard it. It was faint, at first, but it was clear what it was the sound of drums, beating steadily, as though there were a drum circle behind me in the woods. I figured it was someone out in the woods who, one, would kill me, two, would give me weed, or three, would help me out of the woods. So, being lost, I headed towards the sound. As I walked to the sound, it didn't get louder or fainter. It was steady. I just kept walking. As I walked, the beat became more distinct. Definitely a hand drum, not a drumstick. Not a big drum, but more like bongos. I followed the sound until I heard it fade, and then I heard dogs barking. It was at that point I realized where I was. It was a place that I was familiar with. I heard the drums a couple of more times when I was in the woods, but I never figured out where they came from. At one point, I was walking with my cousin, and we both heard it. We swore that it came from deeper in the woods, but we weren't sure who was doing it or why. Now the fun part. I live 18 miles away from that part of the forest, but I'm at the other end of it now. The same forest travels that far. Same forest, different location. Tonight, what made me decide to tell this story was... I was out smoking a cigarette. I stood at the banks of the river that separated the forest from the yard I have, and all of a sudden in the darkness, I could hear the sound of drumming over the hill. It didn't scare me. It brought a smile to my face. This is a personal ghost story that happened to me as a kid. It's the story I always tell when I'm asked for a ghost story. My grandfather on my dad's side died before me or my younger cousin were born. We never knew him, and we never really heard much about him, but we were still very curious. We would talk about him a lot, just the two of us, and try to imagine what he'd be like if he was still with us. At some point as a child, I developed this weird obsession of, like, talking to my grandpa. I did this in all sorts of ways and the only other person who knew about this was my younger cousin. We would have sleepovers a lot, and this would often be a late night discussion. On one particular sleepover, it was not a late night, but we were talking about my grandpa. In fact, it was the middle of a summer day. We were talking about him, and I suggested that maybe both of us should start talking to him like how I did when I was alone. She was super into the idea. We were in her bedroom with the door closed tight. There were no windows open, there were no other people around us, just us, in a completely still house. 
We began talking to him, and we asked a few times for him to give us a sign if he could hear us. We were just about to give up when we decided to ask one more time. I said, Grandpa, can you hear us? Give us a sign. And at that point, the doorknob to my room turned and the door opened. It's around 4.30 a.m. here, and all the dogs in my neighborhood started freaking out at once. I got up to let my dog inside the house, figuring that maybe things would calm down a bit. I opened the back porch door and looked to my right, where there's a fence line to another house. I looked over there because it looked like there were clothes hanging off the fence, and our neighbors have never done that, so I thought it was weird. Then I saw them. Two men in black suits, with no heads. I looked at them for a good minute to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. They didn't move, they just stood there. I could tell that one looked heavier than the other, but that's it. I backed into the house, locked the back door, and turned off the light. I go back to my room and my husband is now awake because of all the dogs barking. I tell him I'm going to wait until it's light out to get the dogs, because I just saw something I can't explain. I told him what I saw, and I said, I feel like I sound crazy, but I know what I saw, and I'm not joking. He seemed like he believed me, but I don't know. I have no idea what these creatures or things could have been. So, this happened when I was 18. I lived with my parents in a sleepy suburb outside of DC. It's a big three-story house with a left side deck, and the basement outside door is beneath the deck. Going underneath the deck is a granite rock staircase out to our backyard, which is a steep 30-degree slope down a peppy little creek. Now that that's out of the way, it's the summer of my senior year, my parents are out of town for a week. I leave the Marine Corps in a few months, so naturally I throw a rager. The party was pretty rad. A metal band showed up at some point. Many a gallon of swill was ingested, and it went on late into the night. At around three, there were a few of us left, just hanging out and shooting the shit. Eventually, everyone falls asleep, except for me and my two friends, Heather and Amber. So we go out on the deck which overlooks the hill and my neighbor's yard, separated from ours by a wooden fence roughly three feet high. They have a rock garden that's tiered with about two feet drop downs for about 20 total feet, with a nice pagoda in the middle. They also have a weeping angel style three foot tall statue overlooking the hill a few feet away from the fence. Anyway, we're out there getting lung cancer, smoking, and we keep hearing these footsteps coming up the rock path. It's pitch black, so we can't see who's coming up, and I didn't want to turn on the floodlights because I'm worried I'll wake the neighbors. I whisper down, drive safe, thinking it's someone leaving the party. The footsteps abruptly stop, and I jokingly call out, good night to you too. Around a minute or so passes and we start getting weirded out, wondering what the fuck that person is doing there, just standing. Amber yells out, Are you okay? No response. So I go inside and grab a flashlight quickly and shine in below the deck to see what the matter is. There's nobody there. I ask Heather and Amber if they heard them walk off and they assured me that they hadn't. This is when Heather notices the statue. I said it was pointed down the hill. Well, it's now turned noticeably toward us. Not facing us, but it's clearly been moved. We get real quiet, light up another cigarette, and start talking about how strange all of this is. Now, I spent eight years in the Corps, and I've seen plenty of funny, creepy, and weird shit since then. But I've never seen anything like I did that night. As we're looking at the statue, it fucking gets turned facing us even more. We all see it and we start freaking out. Not quietly, I say, what the? And right as I do, we hear loud footsteps on the rock stairs again. 
heavy, fast, moving steps. I quickly shine my light down there. For the second time, there's nothing. I shine it over to the statue, and I swear it's been moved another 90 degrees. We then hear squishing, crunching footsteps coming from by the statue. We had a little garden area, maybe eight feet or so, in between the stairs and the neighbor's fence. That's where the footstep sounds are coming from. At this point, we're all scared, but being a guy, and Heather and Amber both being attractive, I exclaim that I'm going to go investigate, to try to calm them down. They say they'll follow right behind me, not wanting to be alone. So we go out the front door and slowly creep our way down the steps. Before we round the corner of the house, we hear the footsteps again, beating feet away from us down the hill. Mind you, there's nowhere to go down there. Just 50 or so acres of woods and the creek, our house being on the ass end of the cul-de-sac. We get to the spot where we heard the crunching and I shine my light down the hill. Nothing but the trees and their shadows. I shine my light to the fence and the statue is now facing us completely. I start to walk over to the fence, shining my light down so I don't trip. And Heather says, Wait, look. I look down and see several massive boot prints. Think shack-sized shoes. They go toward the statue and stop. One of the prints was made around the fucking fence post, like something had stepped through it. Listen, my balls are only so big, so I say, run, and we take off back inside and rush upstairs and into my bed, thoroughly freaked out. We stayed there for about 30 minutes, trying to think of how any of that was possible. Nothing came to mind then, and nothing does now. After about another 10 minutes or so, I realized that I didn't lock the door. So I go back downstairs into the front door. As I lock it and turn around, I hear a fairly loud bang on the deck, like someone or something hit one of the support columns. I promptly decide fuck the neighbors and turn on all of the floodlights and run back upstairs. We stayed up until the sun began peeking through the trees, talking about what the fuck just happened. It was seriously terrifying. That's the end of that night. The statue was back to its normal place when we went to look in the morning sun, and the footprints were gone. I never had anything else happen in that house. My parents still live there and have never mentioned anything. But to this day, it remains one of the creepiest paranormal events I've ever witnessed. This happened after I turned 12 years old. At the time, my father was battling cancer for the second time. I was 10 when he managed to beat it the first time. However, it came back. Despite hoping he could beat it again, things weren't looking so good for him. During his last days in the hospital, I would visit him, despite being out of it. Being a kid, it was rather distressing, seeing him so pale and skinny and barely recognizing me now and then. It was especially bad when I visited him the day before he passed. My mom didn't want to upset me even further, so she sent me to my grandmother's house while she stayed overnight with my father. Since I was old enough to be home for a while, I was sent back to my house, alone. I spent the majority of the day alone, getting a few calls from my mother making sure I was alright. However, while I was sitting in my room playing video games, I got a very off feeling that something had happened. Only minutes after, I received a phone call from my mother telling me that she would be home shortly. Thinking back on the call, I know she was trying not to sound upset, but I didn't pick up on that. I still had this off feeling, and I knew deep down in my soul what had happened. When my mother walked through the door, she told me my father had passed and broke down crying right there. I gave my mother a hug, and as we were facing the door that she had just come through, we saw it. 
we saw a tall, shadowy figure materialize and walk forward into our home. I would assume this was my imagination, but the fact that my mother saw the same thing at the same time proved that it wasn't. We realized my father had probably come home immediately after passing, not wanting to leave us quite yet. Ever since then, I've been a strong believer of the paranormal. Have you ever heard of Great Wolf Lodge? The huge indoor water park packed with arcades, restaurants, and basically everything you could imagine? Well, I've been there twice, and the first time I had an experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. I was there with my brother, my aunt and uncle, and my cousin. We got a room that came with the kid cabin. All that was in the kid cabin was a bunk bed, a small TV, a nightstand, and some cool paintings on the wall. The first night was fine. I slept on the top bunk and Natalia, my cousin, slept on the bottom. The next day, my cousin begged to sleep on the bottom bunk again. So me, wanting the top bunk anyway, allowed it. I stayed up really late that night. I mean, not really, it was like 10.30, but being seven, I thought it was so cool. All I had for light was a small 3DS light. As I started to fall asleep and put down the game, I heard my cousin laughing. Well, more of a giggle. What's so funny? I asked, laughing a little myself. Stop, you're scaring me, she replied, her laughter fading a bit. Well, what? I responded, confused and a bit scared. How are you making that face? All of her laughter had poured out of that innocent seven-year-old's voice by now. I was rushing to turn on my 3DS for the light. I asked, what do you mean? I'm up here. She paused. Who is that? She said, realizing that whoever she was talking to wasn't me at all. She started to cry and call for me. The DS was still loading and by the time it turned on, she said that it was gone. The next day, I asked more about it. She said that there was a girl with black hair, bobbing up and down and smiling really big. To this day, it still scares me. I've been with my boyfriend for going on three years and have known that he is schizophrenic for the past two. He kept information about it to himself up until we moved in together, and a new hallucination gives me the creeps. I'll catch him staring off into the darkness or dimly lit areas for seemingly no reason with a terrified look on his face. He finally explained to me last night that he's been seeing a new figure and he's scared. He's been seeing the same things for most of his life, so he's grown to cope with them. But not this one. This new creature is a dark, six to seven foot tall figure that likes to lurk around the corners in our apartment and stare at him. He describes it as an almost bird or humanoid hybrid with red glowing eyes that just stares and nothing else. This would be normally terrifying just by itself, but it's even more terrifying since I've been seeing the same thing. Normally, I of course write off most of his hallucinations as part of his schizophrenia, and he does as well. But I'm not schizophrenic, and we're seeing the same exact thing. Sometimes I'll see it at the same time he does, but Usually, I see it when I'm home alone. It will be peeking at me by our closet door, only its red eyes visible in the dark. I'll catch a glimpse after I shut my hallway light off. My cats will stay away from the areas that I see it in. I don't believe in the paranormal, and I'm pretty sure I'm not schizophrenic. I don't know what's happening, and I have no idea what to do. Honestly, I'm just scared. My friend tragically died in 2016, only 20 years old at the time. 
Before his passing, he had messaged me, telling me that he would choose me over anything. He tragically passed away on the early hours of Saturday. I never got to reply to his message due to having a very overprotective ex. The day of his viewing was hard, only because I tragically had this regret in my gut, because I was never able to message my friend. I had this huge urge to touch his cheek, but I didn't due to respect for his family members. So when I went home after his viewing, I cried and drifted off to sleep. My dream started like normal. It was like I was just trying to figure a situation out. I was taken to this long hall that reminded me of the movie theaters. I saw my friend and he ran up to me and said, oh my gosh, I miss you and I love you and gave me this huge hug that was so unexpected and then ran off. I will never forget the dream, how he was there and how he made me feel like everything was okay. So the day of his funeral, I didn't go because I was really depressed and I just wasn't ready to say goodbye. I still visit his grave since he was buried a few feet apart from my grandma. I've had a couple of strange dreams about him. One where his lifeless body was in a bathtub with boiling hot water and I kept touching his cheek. I know it sounds weird, but I can't help my dreams are that way. Also another dream happened where I was walking down the stairs and I saw his closed casket in my living room. It was just really strange, but maybe he wanted to tell me everything was fine, that it was okay I didn't reply and that he was at peace. I haven't seen him in my dreams recently, but I do hope he appears soon. I miss his voice and just his laughter brings me more peace when I'm sleeping. Sometimes I sleep next to his pictures. I know he's at peace and I hope he surprises me again in my dreams. I would do anything to hear his voice one more time. When I was about 14, we had this house with this old attic that always creaked quietly. No one ever went up there because it was always locked. But one night when my parents were out of town, my friend Cameron slept over. We were playing video games and watching TV like we always have. At around 8 o'clock p.m., we heard what sounded like footsteps in the attic. We were too nervous to go and check, so we just brushed it off as the house settling and went back to watching TV. Then about 15 minutes later, we heard a heavy slam and a shatter like glass breaking from the kitchen. We ran out to go check, but when we got to the kitchen, there was nothing. No glass, nothing was out of place or broken. So we just looked at each other, confused, and walked away, went back to watching TV. At around 10 p.m., we heard loud footsteps from upstairs. So we got up and checked all the rooms but when we reached the stairs to the attic, we stopped. He pulled out his flashlight, and when he pointed it toward the top of the stairs, we both stopped and got really pale, because what we saw was a tall black figure that had to be at least seven or eight feet tall. It just stood there, staring at us, and then it vanished into thin air right in front of our eyes. That's when we ran outside and called the cops, we left out the part about it vanishing in front of us. We just said that there was someone in the attic. They checked the entire house and said that there were no signs of anyone being there. This is two separate experiences that come together in one big event. One day, I was home with my mom, just hanging out in the living room and watching TV. My mom got a phone call and I watched her go upstairs. Like I literally watched her go up the stairs. A couple of minutes later, I went upstairs to ask her a question. She wasn't up there. I looked all around the house and eventually I found her sitting on the porch, still on the phone. I asked her if she went upstairs and she looked at me like I was crazy. She said she hadn't been upstairs all day. A couple of weeks later, I'm sitting on my bed using my laptop. My mom was getting ready for bed. I looked up and saw my mom standing in my doorway in a white nightgown. 
She sleeps in one just like it, so I didn't think twice about it. Her hair was kind of messed up. She didn't say anything. She just looked at me. And I looked back down at my laptop. When I looked up again, she was gone. I thought she went to her room. I heard something in the bathroom, so I went to check it out. And she was right there in front of the mirror, taking off her makeup, with her hair still fixed from earlier that day, and in her normal day clothes, no nightgown. I asked her how she had changed so fast. She looked at me again like I was crazy. About a month later, my parents got into a really severe car accident where the truck they were in flipped three and a half times and my mom's side almost got T-boned by a semi-truck. According to some people, what I saw was my mom's doppelganger. And when someone sees a doppelganger, it means that something bad is going to happen to that person. I don't know if it was a warning or what, but it was certainly weird. I just want to share a story that happened to my mom when her mother passed away. This story has always given me hope that there is, in fact, an afterlife. My grandfather passed away when I was four. I literally only have one memory of him since I was so young. He came to me in a dream when I was five, and it's one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. Like it was real, and he was really there. My mom used to say that she could feel his presence all the time. Six years later, when I was 10, my grandmother was very sick. We lived in Detroit and my grandmother in New Orleans. My aunt also lived in New Orleans. During the few months she was in and out of the hospital, my mom flew down there to spend time with her mom twice. The second time she flew down there, my grandma was getting worse and was bedridden in the hospital. My mom and aunt spent most of their time in the hospital room and it didn't look good. My mom had to come back home to take care of my sister and I, and I felt guilty that she might not be there when her mom passed away. She came home, and a couple of days later was sitting in our dining room, when she says both of her parents appeared. Not physically appeared, but their presences. My grandma and grandpa were communicating with her telepathically. My grandma said to her, I finally get to see your new house can't believe I had to die to finally do it. My parents had just recently bought their first home. My mom started crying, realizing that her mom was now dead, and my grandpa said, don't be sad, we're very happy now and in a great place. My grandma then said, don't feel bad that you weren't with me in the hospital, because I'm with you now. My mom stood up and walked to our sunroom and sat down, and she says her parents followed her there. My mom said that her dad said something like, We're both in heaven, and this place is the most wonderful place you could imagine. This feeling that I'm about to share with you is a tiny fraction of what it's like here. Immediately following him saying this, my mom said she felt the most intense peace she's ever felt in her life. She couldn't even put it into words. After that, my grandma said, We have to go now, but we'll always be with you. My mom then stood up and walked back into the house. When she walked through the kitchen and passed the phone, it started ringing. This was before caller ID, but she knew who it was. She answered the phone, and it was my aunt, delivering the news of their mom's passing. My mom just said, I know, she and dad just came to see me. My mom and her parents have always had a gift of psychic abilities and an openness to seeing things on the other side. She has no reason to make this up, and I believe her. The two dreams I remember the most in my life is one with my grandpa when I was about five, and one with my grandma shortly after she passed when I was ten. They were the most vivid dreams I've ever had, and I believe they actually came to see me in those dreams. I'm currently 17 and I believe this first encounter took place when I was 13 to 15. It happened sometime in between 8th and 9th grade where I'm from. I remember it clearly. I was just waking up from a nap in my dad's room and looked out his window at our front lawn and street. It was the middle of a clear and sunny day, so there's no way it was just the shadow of a cloud. 
On the other side of our street, a man was jogging. Except nobody was there. It was like a shadow of somebody. Like I'm sure you all know how shadows stretch and shrink depending on where the light's coming from, right? But this shadow didn't. It was as if there was an invisible wall there and a person in front of it. Except there wasn't. It was the perfect outline of a man. I could see straight through it and whatever it jogged by was changed to the mutish gray color that the shadows are. I saw my neighbor's lawn, a tree, the bottom of my neighbor's fence, and many other things, as this thing passed it. I rubbed my eyes a few times just to see if maybe I was seeing something weird or had film on my eyes or something, but no, this weird shadow guy was there, just taking a leisurely jog through the neighborhood. I watched him for a while, completely bewildered. The weird shadow guy didn't really move in regular time. It was almost like he was jogging in slow motion. He would bound up kind of slowly and then come back down just as slowly. Almost like gravity affected him indifferently, or not at all. After that, I went out to my living room to check if I was just seeing things or maybe there was something on the window, but nope. The guy was still there, or the shadow was, still jogging at the same pace. That's all that really happened the first time I saw him. The second time, it was a bit more interesting. I'm not too sure how old I was the second time I saw the shadow guy, but it was a similar situation. I was waking up from a nap in my living room and happened to look out our large rectangular window, which looks out onto the front lawn and street. There he was again, still at the same pace, with the same figure, translucency, and color. This time, I made the mistake of going over to my door and opening it to get a better look at him. I took a step out onto my front step and immediately realized I had made a mistake. He slowly turned toward me and began jogging at me at the same pace in my direction. Almost instantly, I got an uneasy and scared feeling in my stomach, went back inside and closed the door. He turned back to the direction he'd been going in before and continued at the same pace down the street. Afterward, I could feel my heart beating in my chest and I was breathing heavily. I'm not too sure what would have happened if I had stayed outside, but believe me when I say I'm glad I didn't stick around to find out. I'm sure it wouldn't have been good. I did a little bit of digging on my area, Ellicott City, and I couldn't find anything on people that had died while jogging in and around my neighborhood, so I'm stumped. I do remember something I read in a book one time, though. Keep in mind, it definitely wasn't a non-fiction book, as when I did read for fun, I wasn't really into those. What it was called, I can't quite remember, but I do recall the description of it. It was something about shadows and spirits that walk down streets and roads. If you're on the road with it, you're supposed to either cross the street to the other side or run away from it, but I can't remember which. If you let it run through you, it's supposed to steal your soul or something like that. Whether that's an actual description of something or just something made up that was in a book, I don't know. But I thought it was weird how it almost perfectly described what I'd seen. Like, it was almost too similar to just be a coincidence, but I don't know. Since the second sighting, I haven't witnessed him. But I have seen something else. My house was built in 1963, and before we moved in, I heard from my mom that an old couple had lived in the house and that one of them had died inside. There are a lot of things that have happened to my sister and I that could be considered paranormal, but I'll just describe the few that I remember the most clearly. It was the middle of the night and I had woken up for whatever reason. For less than a second, I saw an old lady. The lady was sort of hunched forward and facing away from me. She turned in my direction very quickly before disappearing completely. She had white hair in patches, was very skinny, and was decomposing in several places so much so that I could see bone. 
but her most prominent feature was her jaw. It was detached from one side of her face and hanging off the other. Despite her mouth and face decomposing to the point where discolored flesh was hanging off her face, her teeth were perfectly white and intact. After that, I just lay awake for a while staring at where she'd just been. Nothing. I thought I saw an outline, but I wasn't too sure. That was all I saw of her. I haven't seen her since that time, but I still think about it every now and then. It was definitely weird. This next one is actually kind of funny. It's in the same house, but this time I was in my room at night. I was awake and on my phone, and the door was open a crack. All of a sudden, it opens all the way, kind of slowly, and hits my wall. From the hallway, I hear footsteps walk up to my bed and turn around, but nothing is there. All I say is, why you gotta creep me out like that? It's not cool. And I heard footsteps leave the room and the door closed. It happened a few more times, but at differing points in the day, before I realized that all of these incidents had a commonality. My door was either open a crack or all the way and everyone had to be asleep or I had to be home alone. So I started closing my door all the way, and it stopped. I haven't really heard from this thing since, so I hope whatever it was found its peace. At least this one was a pretty chill ghost. I talked to my sister about it. She says that some similarly weird stuff has happened to her since we moved in as well. This one actually happened this morning, right after I woke up. I kept trying to close my eyes to go back to sleep, but I kept hearing a tapping on my pillow. I couldn't feel it, but I heard it every single time I closed my eyes. It continued until my mom came in and opened my door to let me know she was going somewhere. After that, the tapping stopped. So if I'm not crazy, either there's a new ghost or spirit that came in after one of my parents opened my door to check on me during the night, or it's the same one and it just got stuck after coming in during the same occurrence. If it's the same one, I'm really sorry it hasn't found its peace yet. If it's a new one, well, hope you like my house, I guess. A month ago, my neighbor passed away in her sleep. She was kind and always made a point to say hi to everyone and wish everybody a blessed day. She even went out of her way to wish me a Merry Christmas when I got home from the hospital last year on Christmas Eve. After her passing, weird things started happening, and it's not just in my apartment. My other neighbors, there's eight households in our building, have all experienced weird things. It started with hearing someone shuffle up and down my hallway, which I believed was my roommate at the time. I later found out that he wasn't even home at night because he worked overnights during that month, so it couldn't have been him. Once my roommate moved out, the activity got weirder and weirder. I started hearing someone knock on the door every morning at 3 a.m. We would check and no one would be there. At first we thought we were being ding-dong ditched, until we heard a knock, went to go check, saw no one, and then as we were closing the door, heard the knock again. The door was still partially open, so we knew that there wasn't anyone there to do it. After that, I started having trouble sleeping. Even now, I only sleep two hours a night if I'm lucky. Because of this, I'm usually the witness of it all. I think that whatever is here knows that. I've heard doors opening and closing, my windows sliding open, and my drawers on my dresser slamming shut. The most profound experience was when my fiancé and I were just going to bed and hadn't turned off the light yet, when a shadow figure ran into our room and headed straight for the closet. We both sat, frozen in fear and watched the closet door for a few minutes. Once we calmed down, he laid down and in between us, we heard someone whisper, What are you doing tomorrow? Clear as day. 
The weird thing about all of this is that I know the shadow and the things that happening aren't my neighbor. Yet they all started when she died. My neighbors say that they hear knocking and running too, but they didn't say anything about ghosts or shadow people. They all said it's probably some kids doing the ding-dong ditch thing. I don't think it's people doing it unless kids have found a way to become invisible while knocking on doors. Even as I'm typing the story, I hear loud footsteps in the hallway. There's no one here. I have the door open, and I don't see a single person. I'm honestly terrified. I think we're being haunted by something, but it's far too creepy and evil feeling to be my nice neighbor. A little bit about me and the tribe I grew up in. I know I'm not supposed to share personal information on the internet, so I'll keep this as vague as I can, though some specificity is required to describe the context in which the stickmen are nested. I was born into the Tagatele tribe in central Alaska in the 1980s. This is about 50 miles south of Fairbanks, in a small town called Nanana. Hey, Balto fans. There are several other tribes in the immediate area, and long ago there were far more, before Russian and American settlement. I don't want to identify myself on accident, in case anyone from there ends up reading this, but suffice to say that paranormal experiences are a natural and expected part of my ancestral heritage. As a child, my grandparents and my father told me strange tales of the stickmen who were eaters of men. They especially loved the flesh of children, and newborn babies were considered delicacies by these spirits of the forest. One time, when Nanana was first being settled by Gusuk, or white people, there was a hunter who came from faraway lands to settle the wilderness of Alaska and to hunt its bears and moose. He took a small party of hunters and native guides into the forest deep into the countryside to the marshes, where the moose and bear frequented far down the Tanana they went, shooting every animal they saw, squirrel, moose, wolf, even porcupine. The natives were silent and led the men on, afraid to question their violent and wasteful ways. Until late one evening, the hunter called his party to set up camp and rest. They chose a quiet spot in a field where they could see all around them in case wolves decided to try to sneak up, and they rolled out of their blankets after dinner and went to sleep, leaving some to take turns watching for animals. The hunter had fallen asleep quickly, content on his bed of furs and blankets. He had dreams of sunny days, perfect for hunting the famed grizzly. He was awoken by the sound of cracking sticks. He found this odd as they were in a field but perhaps it was men rekindling a fire. Still, he peeked out of his tent flap to check on the encampment. Horror of horrors. There were pools of blood on the ground, but no corpses. He watched as a man bundled tightly in his blankets was lifted up by what appeared to be many small moving sticks and was carried off toward the edge of camp. The man woke up from the gentle rocking hoofs convoy and screamed alerting the remaining hunters in the camp who jumped up and reached for their guns. They were quick to draw, but were confused by what to fire at, as mostly they just saw sticks on the ground moving in ways that were impossible. They decided to run, because there was nothing clear to shoot at, but as they ran together they were chased by giant animals that appeared suddenly from the tall grass. The hunter waited until the men were being chased by all the animals, and then jumped from his own tent, and, without looking back when he heard their screams, ran as fast as he could. A week later, he showed up in Nanana, crazed, exhausted, and on the edge of death. He related his story, and then perished, for he would constantly wake up screaming if he tried to sleep, and thus he could not rest. A version of this story is common in my family, though some details change with the storyteller. My father has seen the stick men on a hunting trip, and like this apocryphal hunter, he has been crazed and terrorized by the memory ever since. 
It is said that though the stickmen go by different names and come to people in different shapes, that there is some regularity to their appearances. They generally come as either sticks, which blend in with trees or the ground until you come upon them, or they can visit as an animal. This animal is usually described as either a large deer or a small moose, which can move incredibly quickly for how awkwardly it seems to be hunched on its legs. They appear as pale or white animals, and though they usually do this to intimidate men and women, they are hungry beings who feast on the unwary. Seeing a stick man, one may be haunted for years or their entire life afterwards, but in some cases it is considered good luck. As if a stick man is uninterested in you, it means you have powerful ancestors surrounding you. You can usually anticipate the arrival of a stick man as the entire forest will go quiet around you for as long as they are in the vicinity, and sometimes they will speak to you and to each other. When this happens, they sound like a raspy whisper mixed with the rattling of dry willow branches, a light chattering. Do not camp where the forest is silent, and do not look into the eyes of the stickmen, for they will drive you mad with fear. I have never seen these spirits personally. My only experience with one, potentially, happened outside of Carson City, Nevada. I was driving alone in a big Ford pickup late at night when I noticed what originally I took to be a deer on the side of the road. But this was no deer. It ran like a dog or a cat, staying close to the ground in a liquid motion, whereas deer will bounce or gallop as they go. Also, it moved upwards of 30 miles per hour, and when it turned and ran down the hill, I realized it was much larger than almost any deer I've ever seen, yet lacked antlers. I don't know what I experienced that night, but whatever it was, I hope I never see the stickmen. I've told this event to maybe three people in my entire life, in an effort to find some understanding to it, but I just came away feeling more misunderstood. When I was 11, I lived in New Jersey with my parents and two brothers. I never really had anything out of the ordinary happen in the house, until my dad started getting sick. I was being shielded about how sick he was because I was so young, but I know now that he had terminal cancer. This was about October of 86. About this time, I started hearing the footsteps almost every night on the first floor of the house. The bedrooms were all on the second. The dining room and living room were connected by a distinctively creaky wood floor. You knew when it was being walked on. When I first started hearing it at night, I thought it was one of my older brothers sneaking in from being out with friends. But the footsteps never stopped. They circled between those two rooms, walking on that creaking floor until daylight. This went on for months, every night, while my dad steadily grew more ill. I had stopped sleeping. I might doze for the last hour of the morning because I physically couldn't stay up anymore. But here I was, 11 years old, and I was getting pissed. And one night, I decided to confront this thing. My dad had been moved to the first floor of the house for hospice care. This was about April of 87. My mom had finally come to me, even though I knew it in my soul, and told me that he was going to die. One of the last nights, I waited for the steps. Like clockwork, they arrived. It took me a few hours of crawling from my bedroom and down the stairs to get where I needed to be. When I made it to the bottom step, my dad's room was to my right, and the living room and dining room doorway was directly in front of me. I heard the footsteps walk up to the doorway and stop. I saw nothing but darkness. I felt an intense, overwhelming surge of just pure emotion. All the good and all the bad that you can think of mixed together and intertwined into a single feeling. I remember tearing up not out of fear, but just out of raw emotion. Even now, thinking about it makes my eyes water. Was this the scariest thing I ever encountered? Yes, but at the time, it didn't feel evil. 
it's so difficult to describe. A few days later, on April 18th, my dad passed away. I never heard the footsteps again. A few more days after he died in the middle of the night, there was a knocking at the front door. Three loud, sharp knocks in succession. No one else in the house woke up to this either. I was the only one to hear the steps as well, though. No one was at the door. The porch was empty. The knocks are something I still continue to hear. Always a series of three. It doesn't matter if I'm at home or in another place entirely. I hear the knocks. At first I thought it was a sign that someone close to me had died, but they've happened at times when no one that I'm aware of has passed or is even sick. After hearing them for 30 or so years, I'm wondering if it's a type of acknowledgement. I do want to be clear, I don't believe that this was a demon or a traditional haunting. As scared as I was, when I continued to think about this years later, there seemed to be a purpose for this. Maybe it was something that was there to help my dad in his passing. I think I met death, which is of course neither good nor evil. It just is. Death is the balance. I doubt that I'll ever have answers for what really happened, but either way, it made a profound impact on my life. This is something that happened to a friend's brother, and a lot of people say that this town he lived in, which is called Bor in my country of Serbia, is filled with black magic, and generally not so many good things. When he started high school, he moved to Bor and stayed at some student dorms. He had a friend that had this girl that was basically stalking him. She wasn't very attractive, so he just dismissed her, and he'd often joke around about how ugly she was. My friend used to visit his brother in Bor, so he was very aware of this stalker girl. He visited him about once a month. The next time he came, though, the guy was in love with the stalker girl. She would piggyback him and run through the halls and engage in behavior that was pretty abnormal for the guy. My friend naturally asked the guy why he was with this girl, especially when he'd said she was so ugly. This guy picked up my friend by his throat, threatening him, saying that if he ever said anything bad about her, he'd kill him. He asked his brother what had happened to the guy, and his brother told him that this girl did black magic on him. Apparently they found some weird stuff under the guy's pillow, but he wouldn't listen to any of them. So the brother, being fed up with the things going on in the dorms, decided to rent a house out with his best friend while he was there. He told me a lot of creepy stories about that town, but this was one of the creepiest. He said that they were at a student party and were walking back home. He and his friend had to pass this park. Through the middle of the park were these stairs. They had to pass them to get back home, and they were a really long set of stairs. So after the party, maybe two to three in the morning, they're walking past those stairs, and they see a really old woman slowly walking up the stairs, holding both of the rails. They consult each other as to what they should do, if they should help her. But knowing the parts they were in and considering the time, they decided to cautiously walk past her. The brother's friend was the first one to walk past her, and as soon as he did, he just starts bolting up the stairs like his life depended on it. The brother, now reasonably scared, walked past the granny, and he said that the granny looked straight into his eyes, with hollow eyes, and he said she was crying blood. He said he ran so fast he overtook his friend and never looked back. There are a lot of tales of folklore from that town, and knowing them I'm not surprised at what the people who live there tell me. This is a true story from an event that happened when I was just a little boy. I'm a 23-year-old man who, as of late, came to remember a terrifying experience I had as a 7-year-old kid. Back when I was in second grade, my mother and two siblings lived next door to my great-grandparents in a cottage that she rented from them. The rent was cheap, and since it was beachfront property, mom got a real bargain. I lived in the main house given the limited amount of room in the cottage. 
It was spring break, and Mom and I were the only people around the property. My brother and sister were visiting my aunt and younger cousins. I was offered a choice to go too, but I opted out because there was a Godzilla movie marathon all week, and being a huge fan of the monster, I couldn't pass it up. Two nights later, Mom had finished cleaning up the table and I helped with the dishes. Shortly after that, curled up on the living room couch to watch Godzilla vs. Biollante. I must have fallen asleep during that movie because everything in the house was off and Mom was already in bed. At least that's what I could gather. In the lower story of the house, the kitchen tile and the living room carpet were separated by a rubber border that was used to seal the tile and cover the carpet tack strip. The only two animals we had in the house were an Australian Shepherd, who was called Tucker, which easily weighed 60 pounds, and Smokey, a puffy black calico cat who never came downstairs. Now old Tucker had long toenails that would click on the wood top stairs. He'd also make quite a ruckus if he came down the steps, because he was a decent sized dog. I heard a sick slapping sound, like your palms would make if you drum on the tile flooring in the kitchen. Now, if mom was in the kitchen, making herself a snack, she'd need to turn on a light to see. No lights. No mom standing in the kitchen. Nobody at all. I covered my head with my blanket and stayed perfectly still. Another smacking sound of flesh on tile. This one was closer than before. I listened and counted four distinct slaps. Whatever it had been was on all fours. It kept going until the smacking was replaced by the soft padding of feet on carpet. I heard breathing inches away from my face before the source of the sound moved away and up the steps. I stayed awake under the covers until dawn. Mom came downstairs and seemed surprised by my disheveled appearance. She claimed that I came upstairs in the middle of the night, trying to wake her up by snarling like Godzilla. The thing is, I never moved from the couch that night. Even as I type this, it gives me chills. It was a clear night about five or so years ago, and I presume I was driving home from a friend's house. As I'm driving, I felt this strange, powerful energy around me, and since I'm pretty sensitive to energies, I knew that that's what this feeling was. However, I've never had this feeling while driving alone in my car at night. So a few moments go by of this almost weighted feeling of someone in the car with me when my eyes are drawn to the airbag light turning on. Now this light only comes on when there's a passenger or something like a big purse sitting on the seat. But this particular night, the passenger seat was completely empty. I quickly realized someone was sitting in the car with me, but they felt comforting and not at all scary or evil. I then had the urge to reach my right hand out. I don't know where that urge came from, but before I had time to second guess it, my hand was extended over the center console. Then I felt what I can only describe as someone holding my hand firmly and warm. As I felt this energy wrap around my hand, I started to tear up a bit. I believe I said, hello, who are you, out loud, but I might have been speaking to them in my head, I don't remember. After another moment, my hand felt empty. The airbag light went off, and I knew that they were gone. To this day, I have no idea who this person or entity was, or why they wanted to come and see me. But it was a special moment that felt important to both of us. This is the first ghost encounter I can remember. From around age two to five, my family moved into an older rental home. In the brick house next door was a nice family with little kids around our ages. I barely remember them. 
but everyone else remembers that they were very friendly. One day, my mom and I walked to a nearby convenience store. We were almost back home when we saw an old woman in the neighbor's front living room window. We could see her pretty well from the sidewalk. It was so long ago, but with my mom's memory, I can say she wore a dress or a robe. Her hair was pulled back, and she was rocking back and forth in a rocking chair. She was just staring out toward the road. We waved, but she didn't wave back. The next time my mom and the mom next door spoke, my mom asked her who she'd had visiting. She said nobody was. My mom then asked her who the old woman in the rocking chair was the other day. Very casually, my mom claims the woman said, Oh, that was just the old woman who lived here before us. She died. That was her rocking chair. Apparently, it came with the house, and even though she still rocks in it, they kept it. Apparently, they were okay with just living with the ghost. So, it's apparent that some people are totally fine living in haunted houses, but personally, I'm not. This was roughly seven years ago. I worked the night shift on a psychiatric ward in the north of Sweden. I didn't believe in ghosts, but some strange shenanigans were quite often heard in the floor above my ward at the doctor's offices. It sounded like somebody was moving furniture a few minutes every now and then, we had nicknamed those sounds the ghost. One very calm night on the ward, the sound went on for much longer than we expected. So, me and two other colleagues decided to search for the source of the sound. When we went upstairs, we could easily pinpoint the dragging and slamming noises to one particular office of a certain psychiatrist. As soon as we opened the door, it went completely quiet. We stood there for a while, baffled. One of my colleagues let out a, hello? And as a response, two of his desk drawers opened violently and quickly. We ran the fuck out of there. This sound happened on almost a nightly basis, and not the only strange thing I experienced, but it was definitely the most frightening and the hardest to rationalize of all of it. In 2001, my youngest son was hit by a car. He was only four years old. It was very bad. He stopped breathing, his heart stopped, and he was revived three times. The neurologist told my wife and I that the injuries were severe and that most likely he would not survive the night. We were devastated. He was in a coma, naturally, and also they added meds to make sure he stayed that way just to keep his brain pressure down. He did survive the night though, and about a week later he woke up. After they took out the breathing tube, he could talk. He kept asking where Veronica was. I asked the nurses if one of them, or one of their co-workers, was named Veronica. They said that nobody worked there with that name. I asked him what Veronica looked like. He said she was an old woman who talked funny. I asked if she was dressed like the nurses, and he replied no, she always wore the same clothes, a blue dress with yellow flowers. I asked what she said to him. He told me that she would come stand by his bed, hold his hand, and tell him she loved him and that everything would be okay. A few hours later, my in-laws showed up. I told my father-in-law about what my son was saying, and he turned white. He said he knew exactly who Veronica was. It was his mother, Veronica. She was from Slovakia and had a heavy accent, and she was buried in a blue dress with yellow flowers. Our son is named Joseph Michael. We found out after he was born from my father-in-law's older sister that they had had an older brother named Joseph Michael, who died in Slovakia at around four years old. My father-in-law was the only one born in the U.S. If I would not have experienced it, I wouldn't have believed it. But my son's great-grandmother reached out from across the grave to comfort her son's namesake. I also believe 
that she helped to make sure we would not relive the tragedy she went through. Pure love is the most powerful force in the universe. It can break time and space boundaries. If you're wondering, Joseph is doing just fine. He has issues from the brain injury, but he's a very intelligent 21 year old now. He lives with us. Ever since he came home from the hospital all those years ago, we've had many experiences with things paranormal happening to us as well. Sometimes I wonder if since he died and was revived, he's closer to that side and attracts spirits. Either way, it was a beautiful experience, Veronica, and we're ever so grateful that she showed up. I want to tell you about the times that I was mimicked, or at least the times that I encountered a mimic. The first one was actually a mimic of my sister. My other three siblings were at home and wanted to get takeout, so they called for my sister who was not in the house at the time. She was outside with me. Now, I don't know if this is fake or not, but someone answered, or something did, and they said it sounded exactly like her. When the food came, they called for her again to get her stuff, but this time, no one answered. So my brother took the pizza to her. He went inside the room just to find no one there. A dark, empty room. When they told me this, I could confirm that she was with me, but I didn't know whether to believe that something actually mimicked her or not. I thought they were just pulling our leg. The second time was a mimic of me, and I was scared out of my wits. My mother wanted to go out to the 7-Eleven store, and I was like, nope, not gonna happen because it was really late at night. She ended up leaving anyway, and I was pretty upset, sulking in a corner. I was really scared because I had been watching too much Criminal Minds and that shit makes you paranoid. So after her little run, she stood at the bus stop waiting for the bus. When she heard me behind her, she legit heard Mama in my voice. I was even more terrified when she told me because again, it was my voice and I was clearly not behind her. I still didn't believe it though. But a lot of things have happened in my household, like some scary shit, and I guess this just adds to it. I still have a hard time believing it, but I don't know why my mother of all people would lie. Would you believe it? Or would you think it was nonsense? This was told to me by my mom and dad when I grew up. I am Native American and raised both spiritual and Catholic. My father's side of the family is spiritual and believes in ghosts and respecting them. I was raised like that. When I was a few weeks old, my parents and auntie were walking to the store with me. My dad was carrying me with my mom on one side of him and my aunt on the other. The store was about two blocks away from my grandma's house on a dirt road. But it was on the reservation, and she lived in an area with a lot of houses on both sides of the street. When they reached the halfway point, my mom noticed a light on in a vehicle. She thought that someone left the dome light on and told my dad. While looking at the van, I began to cry. My mom said that it wasn't my normal cry, so she started checking to see if I was okay. The closer they walked toward the van, the brighter the light got. My auntie told my dad to cover me up and not let any part of me show while she started praying in their language. My mom said at this point I was screaming and she was terrified. Then I stopped and at the same time the light went out. My dad later explained that when they got closer the light was getting brighter and brighter like a spotlight. But the light didn't have a source because the van was in an accident the week prior and the battery was gone, along with most of the engine. A man who was driving passed on. It's relevant because my dad was looking at the van and he swore he saw an outline of a person in the driver's seat and thought somebody was playing a prank. My auntie's version was the same, but after she was praying, she kept looking at the van and 
She said she saw a small ball of light shoot out of the driver's door and toward the house. She didn't tell my parents because my mom was freaking out. My mom only said that everything was quiet when the light was getting brighter. She didn't hear dogs barking, and they always bark on the res. No birds were cawing, and there was no other noise other than my crying. So that's that. My first paranormal experience, and I wasn't even aware of it. I was about seven or eight, and my parents were out of the house for group stuff. We're pagan. My aunt, who lived in Ohio, was with us at the time. She had to watch us. I remember walking into the living room and seeing my aunt and brother watching Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. I smiled, grabbed my iPad and my earbuds, and walked back to the bedroom. After a couple of minutes, I thought I heard walking from the hallway. I looked over and saw a woman that I didn't know walking with her head down in all white clothes down the hallway. I screamed, but nobody heard me until I ran out of the room crying. It felt like I was dreaming or having a nightmare while I was in the living room because nobody could hear me until I literally sat by my aunt. Then she told me something. I was crying and I said, I saw something walk past my bedroom. She said, oh no. But I have a question for you. Did one of your relatives ever die? Then I remembered we were living in my great-grandparents' house, and they died three years ago. And while the lady was walking down the hallway, she was going toward my parents' room. That's where my great-grandmother used to sleep before she died. This story is a few years old now but it's interesting nonetheless. This involves what I believe to have been a poltergeist. I was already very interested in spirits and had attempted to communicate with them various times. This is the first and only time that communication was successful. To protect mine and others' identities, the names in this story are fake. Every other detail, however, is completely true. When I had just turned 19 years old, I moved out of my grandparents' house for the first time with my best friend Alex and my ex-boyfriend Tim. Alex's son would be at the house every other week because Alex was separated from his mother. Let's call the kid Rex. Rex was a very cool kid. He was only three years old, but was still able to beat me at Mario Kart Double Dash, which I grew up on. Because he was so smart, Alex didn't question it when Rex would talk to himself, because apparently a lot of smart kids do this. One day, being the self-proclaimed ghost hunter that I am, I asked who he was talking to. Rex looks back in the direction he was originally talking and then back to me after about five seconds. Nobody, he said, and went back to talking quietly and playing. Tim and I exchanged freaked out looks, but Alex exclaimed, see, he's not talking to anybody. I didn't buy it, despite him still being a close friend. A few weeks go by and I find myself babysitting Rex, alone at the house. He was playing outside, on our carport that we turned into a porch. I told him it was time to go inside so that I could make him lunch. He sat at the dining room table and I sat in the living room next to the door to the carport. I'm scrolling through Facebook when all of a sudden I hear one of Rex's toys start singing. I peep out the blinds on the window of the door and I couldn't see anything that would make it go off. I figured it was a squirrel and sat back down. Not a minute later, it started singing again. I opened my camera app on my phone and began recording. It didn't stop until Rex came into the living room to proclaim that he was done with his sandwich and was ready to go back outside and play. I compromised with him into watching something on Netflix instead, without giving away any details. 
I ended up brushing it off, thinking maybe somehow the button was stuck. Another week or so goes by. I'm home alone, as I had a day off from my job at Pizza Hut, but the guys were at work. I was doing the dishes in the kitchen. Our kitchen was pretty nice. A nice fridge on the opposite side of the kitchen than the sink had liquor bottles on top of it, sat toward the back of the fridge. As I was listening to music and finishing up, a bottle flew off the fridge and smashed into the opposite wall. I waited in Tim and I's bedroom until Alex got home and explained what happened. He said it was probably sitting up there for so long that it found its way to the edge. I became quite scared of whatever was going on at this point. But my ex and best friend were signed on to the lease, and anything beat living with my grandparents again, even though I ultimately moved back home. Yet another week goes by and I'm out delivering pizzas. I rode by the house fairly often on my routes because we lived next door to the strip my store was in. I glanced over on this particular day and saw a raggedy lady standing outside our carport door. She was wearing tattered clothing and her hair was curly and unbrushed. She was just standing there, staring at the door. I immediately called Alex, maybe three seconds after seeing her. He answered immediately. I told him to go look out the door at the carport, and he did without question. He said, I don't see anything, and I explained to him what I saw. He didn't know what to think of it. At this point, I was seriously concerned. I began stating we needed to protect the house, and wore a blessed necklace a friend of mine from college had made for me. The last experience I had in this house isn't the reason I moved out but happened shortly before I did. I went to sleep early one night, being high off my ass. I normally wouldn't go to sleep without Tim because of the events that had been happening. I left the door cracked open and a small standard nightlight on to give me peace of mind. About three minutes after falling asleep, my eyes dart open. I realized I had fallen asleep on my back which often leads to minor sleep paralysis for me. I had taught myself a trick, wiggling my toes to get out of it. But no matter how much I wiggled my toes this time, I couldn't get out of it. I then heard the door creak open. I was relieved because I thought it was Tim. But when you're paralyzed in your sleep, it's never what you want it to be. The raggedy lady I had seen outside of my carport door glided to the corner of my bed. I couldn't see any details of her face. It was like someone had shaded it out with a pencil. She was wearing the same tattered striped shirt, and what I could now see was a long black skirt. I want to speak to the boy, she said. I'm not sure if I actually said anything to tell her okay as I was mortified. But sure enough, Rex, who was in the room over, glided into the room next to her, and I woke up. I immediately bolted out of bed and opened Rex's bedroom door. He was muttering in his sleep. I told Alex and Tim what happened immediately, but neither of them seemed concerned. None of us live in that house anymore, and Alex has told me that Rex no longer talks to himself go figure. I never saw the raggedy lady again, and I hope I never do. My family moved into a new house after my mom got remarried. The houses were built in the 50s, had only one or two previous owners to us. Upon moving in, we all experienced some strange things, wall sconces being lifted off the hook and thrown across the room, hearing sighs, voices, and general unease in certain parts of the house. There's no doubt that home was also home to a handful of spirits, however fairly benevolent. As time progressed, my at the time stepfather, who I'll call Larry, became increasingly hostile, angry, abusive, 
and altogether just incredibly nasty. It was known that he had various mental illnesses, including depression, bipolar disorder, and alcoholism. It was a slow progression with him, until the last few extremely bad years, as were the paranormal experiences. Looking back on our situation, there seemed to be an uncanny correlation between his anger and the spiritual turmoil. Many of the unsettling occurrences were directly related to him also. The first doppelganger experience that occurred was one morning when my father picked me up for his weekend visitation. About an hour after we left, my mom and Larry both heard my voice clearly calling Larry's name from outside. Only his name, which was unlike me because I never had a good relationship with him. They got up to inspect, and eventually called to ask, just to find out that my dad and I were already in the other state that my dad lived in. The second was one super cold night, right after my younger sister was born. My mom had run out for some reason, and I was on the couch with Larry watching TV while he was feeding my newborn sister. My mother came inside to ask what Larry was doing out there, saying that she saw him kicking through the snow in his very distinct eagle's jacket. He disappeared behind the cars as my mom drove up the street, and she assumed that he had used a different door than the front to get back inside. But he was next to me the entire time she was gone. My mom has many stories about how their bed would vibrate and shake in the middle of the night and wake them up, but has a particularly unsettling middle of the night story. She was awake, but Larry was asleep. As she laid there, she says a black shadowy mass spilled into their room from under the door, traveled up the wall and over the bed to above him, then completely disappeared. My younger sister says that she saw the exact same shadowy mass at his new apartment while visiting him after he and my mom split. Other than me, the rest of my family is incredibly religious, and they don't really believe in ghosts, so I don't know why they would make up stories like these if they didn't happen. The last few years of their marriage were the worst with his violence, anger, and volatility, as was the horrible, thick feeling of bad energy in the home. It became normal to us to hear things, see things fly off shelves and tables, and to feel absolutely terrified and nauseated to be in certain parts of the house. Since their divorce, we all moved out, and my mom has only experienced one possibly paranormal experience. She was laying on the couch at night, and I happened to be visiting. I was in my sister's room when we heard my mom yelling, Larry! Larry? Then flipping out and running into the room. She claimed to have seen him clear as day, leaning over her, and for a split second, she forgot they were even divorced and that he shouldn't have been there. She said he went into the kitchen and she came running for us, but after a thorough search of the apartment, absolutely nobody was there. Our theory is one of two things. One, he's got some sort of demonic, negative, paranormal energy attached to him. His mental illness and inability to control himself leads us to believe that he was a weak target for attachment. The anger and straight-up deplorable things he's done to my family makes it easy for us to believe this. In addition, it's commonly believed that demonic presences are the only ones able to mimic one's voice and appearance. Maybe we're just reaching for a reason to push his horrible deeds onto something paranormal, to not believe that a person is capable of such things. The second theory is that his extreme and uncontrolled energy has manifested itself into some sort of poltergeist activity, explaining all of the noises, movement, visions, and bad energy. We're not really sure what's going on, but it was terrifying. I was driving alone to my parents' house about a two-hour drive from where I live. It was 2 a.m., and I had already had a long day, so I started to feel very sleepy, and pretty soon, 
I started to doze off and lean forward in my seat. Then, I felt something squeeze my right shoulder and pull me back in the seat. I felt this squeeze on my shoulder for a couple of minutes and I just looked straight ahead. I didn't dare look in the rearview mirror because I felt a presence in the back seat. I got this tingling feeling throughout my entire body, almost like I'd had too much caffeine. The squeeze eased up and I didn't feel tired at all after that. I made it to my parents safely. I have no way of explaining this. I don't know if it was a guardian angel or a passing ghost. I don't really know what it was, but whatever squeezed my shoulder definitely saved my life. I work at a bar restaurant in downtown Denver on a very old block. Everyone has had ghost experiences, ranging from, oh well, that could have just fallen off by itself, I guess, to experiences that made people grab their stuff and run out during clothes. I luckily haven't had the second yet, but today was finally something that happened to me, and it was kind of creepy. My experience with Josephine, as we've named her, has mostly been trash being taken out when I get a new liner ready and the bag full of trash is nowhere to be found when I'm alone or the occasional footsteps going up and down the stairs when I'm by myself. Today I was opening alone and nobody else would be in for another hour or so when this happened. I came in and locked the door, went into the kitchen to get some fruit, and heard someone in the dining area say, hello, like they needed something. I peeked into the dining room, but nobody was there. I'm thinking, hmm, I locked the door behind me. Maybe it's just someone on an ad on Spotify. But then I realized I hadn't turned on Spotify yet. I kind of brushed it off and went into the office to set up my drawer as I was walking to the bar area. I heard it again, but this time it was right behind me. It said, um, hello? this time sounding just as alarmed as I was. I turned on the music really loud, hoping not to hear it again before the other people came in. When I moved out of my house, I moved into an old creepy house. The heating didn't work, the windows wouldn't close properly, and the cupboards were full of these elaborate handmade shelves. There were doors that led to rooms that led to other rooms that didn't make any sense. The house just didn't seem to have a normal layout. But the creepiest room was the laundry room. It was a large square room with white tiles with a drain in the middle. Just think of a location inspired by the Saw movies. When you walked into this room, it had three steps down to the floor. On the right was a sink and two doors, one for a shower and the other for a toilet. Straight ahead was the door to the garage, and next to it, on the left, the cupboard under the stairs. The cupboard was freezing cold, but it was completely cement and brick, no draft and no gaps, just pitch black darkness. I lived with three other people, but our schedules were all mixed, so Tuesdays were my nights alone. I started to notice things like glass breaking in the kitchen, but I'd walk in and nothing was broken. I'd walk outside to get the mail and close the door behind me with my dog inside and come back to see her on the front step. Then the nightmares started. Night after night I'd have terrifying nightmares of someone knocking on my door and getting up to answer it and no one being there. I brushed all of this off as just the product of an idle mind. Then one night, I was home and watching TV, and suddenly I heard a loud rattling. I jumped to my feet and walked to the laundry door, where I could hear the rattling on the other side. Probably somebody trying to get in through the locked garage, I thought. I opened the door, and the garage door handle was still, but the cupboard one wasn't. The entire door was shaking violently, like someone was inside the cupboard, trying to get out. I froze, but just for a minute, grabbed my dog and left the house until someone agreed to come over with me. I had a friend come over and we both walked inside. 
I sat on a stool well over a meter away from the wall. My friend sat at the table. Maybe you have ghosts, she said. I just want to add that I was raised religious and told that there was no such thing as ghosts for 18 years of my life. In my head, there had to be a logical explanation, and my fears were surely irrational. There's no such thing as ghosts, I scoffed. Without another second, I felt pressure on my shoulder, which pushed me off the stool and slammed me onto the wall in one quick motion. To clarify, I didn't fall off the stool. If I did, I would have hit my head on the wall. Instead, my entire body was slammed into the wall. I stood and looked at my friend, and she looked at me. We said nothing to each other. I grabbed my keys and my dog, and we went to get dinner. Nothing was ever spoken about it. I moved out shortly after, but I will never say that ghosts don't exist again. I was 24 or 25 at the time and worked for a private Catholic hospital in Auckland, New Zealand, which was over a hundred years old. My shift of preference was the night shift, from 11 o'clock at night to 7 in the morning, as I didn't have to deal with all the political crap that goes on in hospitals. This hospital was run by nuns of the Mercy Order that originated in Ireland. These nuns kept a close eye out on how the wards were run and operated, and it was not uncommon to see them in their habits, checking on how things were going any time of the day or night. They were extremely strict, but they did care about their patients. Originally, the hospital had been a free hospital, but at some stage had become private and catered to those who could afford to use their services which actually in New Zealand is not too much of an issue, as we have a free public hospital system here, where I did my training and worked for most of my nursing career. Anyway, on the ward that I was working on at the time, I was sole charge that night, with a supervisor who would pop in when I needed her to check on medications for patients or the help if I needed it. So I rarely saw anybody during the night, apart from, as I mentioned before, my supervisor, or the odd nun who would pop in rarely to make sure everything was all right. This one night at about 3 a.m., I was in the sluice room, emptying a bedpan one of the patients had just finished with. The sluice sink is only a few feet from the door, and as I stand there facing the sink, the door is to my left-hand side. Obviously, due to the noise that is made in sluice rooms, I always made sure that the door to the sluice room was firmly shut before I started to do any work in there, so as to cause the least disturbance to patients trying to sleep. So I'm standing at the sink, rinsing the metal bedpan before putting it into the sterilizer, when out of the corner of my eye, I suddenly saw a tall nun standing in front of the sluice room door. She was tall, thin, wearing an old-fashioned habit, all black barring the white bit around her face. She had her hands clasped in front of her, and I got a sense of slight disapproval from her. She looked to be in her forties, perhaps. All this from out of the corner of my eye. My thought was, perhaps I was being a little noisier than I thought, and she was about to let me have it. I admit I did jump because I didn't hear her enter, but I put it down to concentrating on what I was doing, a couple of seconds after I became aware of her, I finished what I was doing and turned to face her. To my utter shock, there was nobody standing there. The door was still firmly closed, and there's no way she could have left the room without the door being opened. I admit I stood there for a couple of minutes so my heart rate could slow down, and so my breathing could return to normal. I put it down to one of the old nuns who had passed, just checking up on the staff to make sure they were doing their job properly. I couldn't actually ask any staff if they had seen anybody before in that area of the hospital, as it really wasn't the sort of place where talking about ghosts was really accepted. I was young and didn't have the self-confidence that I have these days, but it was still an interesting experience. 